Okay, uh, let's see, untimed items. Um, how about the CHD child abuse prevention proclamation and flag raising request? Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? All right, do you want the proclamation read or just the motion? Uh, just the motion will be fine. I move that the select board proclaim April 2013 as Child Abu Abuse Prevention Month. Aaron's not here. How are we going to second, second. our motions? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the children's memorial flag to be raised. I'm sorry. I move that the select board approve that the children's memorial flag be raised on the town common on April 30th, 2013. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. That is an annual um, um, commemoration of uh, drawing attention to child abuse prevention that happens uh, on the common and they have a nice little ceremony that's associated with that so uh, if folks are watching for yet another flag flying in Amherst on that day that is what that is okay next uh, untimed items how about the common victuallers licenses Ms. Stein. I move that the select board approve a common victualler license for Bassam M. Fom doing business as College Pizza at 150 Fearing Street, Sundays through Thursday from 11 a.m. to 12 a.m., and Friday and Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 a.m., Basem M. Pham, owner slash manager, pending issuance until any slash all outstanding regulations have been satisfied. Need a second. Second. Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, unanimous. I move that the select board approve a common Victoria license for Pioneer Valley Pizza LLC at 356 College Street, Sundays through Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. Joseph R. Bowman, manager. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. We have three more minutes. Uh, let's see. Special liquor licenses. I move that the select board amend the special wine malt license approved for UMass Amherst for a reception to be held from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. April 27, 2013 at the Fine Arts Center to a 12.30 a.m. closing time, Judy Bardwell, clerk, top of the campus, incorporated. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve the special wine and malt license for the Springfield JCC for a Pioneer Valley Jewish Film Festival benefit party to be held in the studio theater of the Amherst Cinema, Amity Street, Amherst, on April 14, 2013, from 2.30 p.m. to 5 p.m., Dylan Wiley, Festival Director. Second. Further discussion, Ms. Brewer. I just wanted to mention quick that as it says here, that's gonna be in the studio theater, their brand new space that's in the little side part, so that's exciting to see them utilizing that. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, further discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. that's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the special wine and malt license for Eva Fierst for the art salon artist presentation and talk to be held in the Eric Carl Museum from 6 to 9 p.m. on April 11, 2013. Raphael Ellison, caterer. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the special wine and malt license for R and P liquors for the spring jam to be held in the library gardens at Hampshire College from one PM to six PM on April twentieth, two thousand thirteen. Nathan Day, owner slash manager. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the following special wine and malt licenses for receptions to be held in the locations and dates slash times cited below, Judy Bardwell, clerk, top of the campus incorporated, 
Fine Arts Center, April 24th, 2013, 5 to 7 p.m. Eisenberg SOM um, Atrium, April 25th, 2013, 4 to 6 p.m. Engineering Lab 2 Atrium, April 27th, 2013, 4 to 5.30 p.m. Um, Conti Building Atrium, May 14th, 15th, 2013, 5.30 to 7 p.m. Conti Building Atrium, May 17th, 2013, 4 to 6 p.m. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Excellent. Perfect timing. And it is now 645, which is time for our public hearing on a liquor license application for Hickory Ridge Golf Course. We are calling this public hearing to order at 645 p.m. And we have an attorney for the applicant here. And uh, I'll note for folks that uh, all of the materials related to this public hearing are on the Slack Board's web packet. And uh, this has been duly noticed and a butters noticed, et cetera. So welcome, please introduce yourself for folks at home. Um, I'm attorney Tom Reedy from Bacon, Wilson and Amherst, uh, Peter McConnell's office, here on behalf of the applicant Hickory Ridge Grill, um, LLC of 191 West Pomeroy Lane in Amherst. Um, we're here um, for a new all alcohol liquor license, a section 12 restaurant on premise. And with me this evening is uh, Bill Rosenblum, who is the general manager of the property and the head golf professional, as well as the proposed manager of record for the liquor license. Um, the application, as I, know, as I mentioned, is for a new annual uh, all-alcohol restaurant at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, um, and it's seeking the appointment of Bill Rosenblum as the manager. The notice describes the premises pretty um, succinctly. It, it's gonna consist of a one-story frame building with dining area and lounge on the main level, consisting of approximately 4,720 square feet, a finished lower level consisting of approximately 2,703 square feet, an open air cocktail plus patio area consisting of approximately 3,616 square feet, and the entire premises of the 18-hole golf course, um, including three structures, at the 6th, 7th, 6th uh, and 7th tee box and the 17th tee. And there will also be service on the course with a beverage cart. And the liquor storage is in the kitchen in a locked closet. Um, so it's, it's pretty secure. As far as the corporate structure goes, um, Hickory Ridge Grill is a Massachusetts limited liability company. Um, the principal place of business is at 191 West Pomeroy Lane in Amherst. And it was qualified to do business uh, in the state July 16th of 2012. Uh, it has two members, uh, Jeffrey Fisher and David Wasenda, both 50% uh, have 50% interest. And the manager of that LLC is Bill Rosenblum. He has no beneficial or financial uh, interest in the license. Um, as I mentioned, the premises is as noticed. Uh, we've also got um, a floor plan that you'll find in the application packet. Um, what's not in the application packet is from the Amherst uh, GIS map, and I've got some. If you'd like to take a look, you will notice that it is all on one side of a public way, and therefore the beverage cart will not need to go across any public way, and therefore does not need um, a transportation license. As you're aware, um, there are golf course regulations and guidelines, and, and the licensee, if it's granted, uh, would follow all of those guidelines. Um, they won't sell until they're licensed, obviously. Um, we've spoken with the general counsel of the ABCC, and they've okayed our description of the premises. Um, they do have Hickory Ridge uh, Grill has a legal right to occupy. occupy. They are the tenants of a lease. Um, Applied Golf Hickory is the landlord. It would begin upon the approval of the liquor license. It's a five-year term with three five-year options at the rate of $2,000 per month, and there's no percentage rent, so it's not based off the sales of alcohol. The premises are contiguous and appurtenant. There are no public ways that intersect or divide, and then so therefore no transportation license is required. 
Um, the licensee will not allow the patrons to possess or carry on public ways. Um, and because there are no public ways, no signs are required um, noticing, notifying the public of such. And although the private driveway is a private way, um, it's not included in the description of, for the liquor license specifically. Um, as far as the impact on the neighborhood, I think the, um, the board will find a letter from the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Tony Maroulis, and I know that um, it was a, a positive letter. Um, also, the chief of police recommended this um, license move forward. You know, the, the licensee uh, doesn't intend to be a destination for college students. It's for golf. Primarily, I know that the liquor license, um, it has, the premises has been licensed for years. It was foreclosed upon, and the um, foreclosure, the license was not pledged, and so the previous owner had the license, and so a transfer was not, um, didn't come to fruition, and so that's why we're here on this new license. Um, it's a, it's a top-notch uh, first-class facility. They've got um, great, great little brochures, um, a great scorecard. I don't know if anybody's been out there, but you know they want to make it their goal not to become that college destination. And I don't see why, and uh, I know Bill doesn't see why that would happen. That it would become a college destination. Um, speaking of Bill, he's uh, 44 years old from Ludlow, United States citizen, and Massachusetts resident. He is the general manager of Hickory Ridge, head golf professional there. He has been, uh, he's well known and well respected in the area. He's been a head golf professional for at least 10 years. Um, he also has food and beverage um, service experience and he's TIP certified. He understands completely that it's 100%, he's 100% responsible and he's there 60 plus hours a week. Um, you can go in any time to the clubhouse and, and see him there. Um, and so, you know, we would, uh, we would request that you uh, grant this new annual uh, license and the appointment of um, Mr. Rosenblum as the manager. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very thorough presentation. Um, so just so folks know how this will happen, we'll start with questions from the select board. We'll, we'll then go to questions and comments from the public. At the end of questions and comments from the public, we'll close the public hearing and then the select board will deliberate on this. So starting with questions from the select board, Ms. Stein and then Ms. Brewer. I was wondering how uh, the facility differ, will differ in appearance, if it will differ in appearance from the previous facility out there, which we're very familiar with. Uh, the facility itself. Since you need to come to the come mic, to actually, the so because this is being televised. Thank you. Since the closing on the facility, uh, we opened April 18th last season, and I believe the it was purchased in the middle of March. But since the closing on the facility, the the facility itself in front of the building, the bushes have been. Uh, have been removed. We've done some mulching. The building itself has been repainted. There has been repainting on the inside in the lounge area, the restaurant area. The golf shop has been upgraded with paint, and it, the facility itself has been cleaned up to where there was, it, it's just a little bit overgrown over time, and we've put in also, I believe, a, a, a vinyl fence in front of where the air circulation system is so that it's not visible from the road. We're also, I believe, in the process of putting, uh, getting a logo for the building itself to put on the front of the building. A new sign was placed out front to make it known that we are open to the public. And just that I, I do know that when we were last season with the construction in front of Atkins, I had many people that would be de detoured through uh, Moody Bridge slash West Pomeroy Lane. And I had several people come in not even knowing that the, the facility was there. So um, it's helped us out a little bit, plus with the new signage. We are putting new signs on our tees to update the facility and give it more of a New England Cape Codish look. So th there's, being, there's a lot that's being done through the management company to upgrade the facility itself on the outside. Thank you very much. Um, do you have a follow-up, Mr. I, I do. <clears throat> do you have um, hours that you serve meals at? I take it you serve meals but not liquor at this point. Is that correct? Well, at this point right now, we're in the process. Uh, we have a new food and beverage manager who is here this evening, and we're in the process of looking to start serving food around April 19th is our okay. target date. We're in the process of 
interviewing staff, uh, setting up accounts with vendors or existing vendors at this time. Also, um, obviously, uh, we are not serving food at this point. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Thank you. Yes. That's very good. Ms. Brewer. Um, before my question, following up on what you just said, it's my understanding, just for the people out in the public, that um, even if you weren't serving meals, there would be certain food items that would be required to be available for people if there's alcohol on the premises. So that's just the usual standard. So even before, you know, depending on how their timing works with ABCC, et cetera. But yes, we look forward to you being able to say, yes, and we have meals, and you can come here even if you don't like golf. We've been um, waiting for that for <laughs> quite some time. <laughs> so that'll be helpful. The, this, the thing I wanted to ask you about actually follows up on what Ms. Stein said as well, which is that because so many of us are familiar with the facility from before, and it's great to hear that you've been able able to put some money into freshening things up a little bit. The actual floor plan, I mean, because this isn't a new facility, the floor plan itself, in terms of how you're doing the service, hasn't changed, basically. Um, well, and so that part hasn't changed. And following on that, then if you'd also speak to, I just don't recall whether or not we had service on the course previously and how that worked. There has been service on the golf course in the past where there, we have a beverage cart. The beverage cart, I was an assistant years ago there under the past head professional, and there was service at that time also. It was usually limited to uh, outings or special events, but in the nature of giving service to the people on the golf course as well with not necessarily just liquor, but obviously water and snacks to keep people hydrated in, in the sense of safety, it has been operated in the past. Great. Thank you. So it's really just more of the same in, in many it, respects. It's more of the same, it. but it, it's an upgraded menu yeah. and facility Thank itself. You. Other questions from Select Board? Mr. Webb. Very, very briefly, I appreciate the comment from Council about not becoming a college destination just in light of recent issues in the town. But I have to say, since I, we all, as my colleagues have said, we all know the place we've met there and I worked down the road from there. I've been to meetings there. It never was a college destination, so I, I, it's good to make that point, but I think we should make clear to the public that this is not a likely uh, prospect in any case. It never was. Thank you. Um, you mentioned being TIPS trained yourself, or the attorney mentioned you're being TIPS trained. Will your staff be TIPS trained as well? Yes, our food and beverage manager, uh, it's we were just looking into if the uh, TIP uh, certification is transferable from state to state at this point, but uh, anyone that's going to serve will be TIP certified prior to serving food. Terrific. Um, and so we've made the point about the college town. I mean, this is kind of the big concern here. Obviously, it's not, it's not a destination for that, but you are aware of the, the particular challenges that exist in a place like Amherst. Well, as I said earlier, I, I was an assistant there for six years. I was a member at one point as a, as a college student. Um, I'm, as I said, I grew up in South Hadley. I know the area very well. I know the atmosphere in the town of Amherst with the colleges in the area. And it, it never has ever in the past gotten to that point where it's been anything like that. Generally, if anything, within the parameters of the hours of what the service is going to be, generally they're cleared out by probably no later than 11 o'clock as it is. Um, but as a manager and, and the, on the liquor license, obviously it's, uh, I don't want it to be that way and especially since the, it'd, be, it'd be bringing back something to South Amherst that hasn't been, that's been missing for about a year or so. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. Just to mention, so when they are ready to do meals, we, we, they don't have a common vic right now because they wouldn't so. have any reason to. So they would get a common vitular license, Board of Health, usual, blah, blah, thanks. Other questions from Select Board? All right, questions or comments from the public? If you could come forward, if you could just yield the mic to this woman, please. And identify yourself for the folks at home. My name's Evelyn Bloom, and I'm a, um, an abutter most closely to the parking lot. And um, I consider myself a friend to the golf course. I've enjoyed being a neighbor to the golf course. I do want to point out, though, for... Um, planning for the future that um, it's not uncommon that the parking lot get a little bit rowdy and noisy at night after an event. And if there is a way to take into consideration any kind of buffer trees or if anybody can kind of keep an eye on the parking lot and what's going on out, out there because um, the sound travels right across that 
West Pomeroy Lane, and uh, their house is right there. So I just wanted to point that out. You may not even have realized it. I've never called and complained, but um, you know things happen, even if they aren't college students. And I've heard a lot of little spats <laughs> over the years. So just wanted to point that out and Thank ask you. that attention be paid to that. Thank you very much. So that's good information for the applicant to have. That's not actually in the purview of the select board. That would be in the um, ZBA or planning board, whoever does the permit for the, um, for the property. But I'm sure that the applicant is looking to be a good neighbor to a butter. So I'm sure they appreciate having that information. Other folks with public comment on this license application? OK, any other questions or comments from the select board? Um, I'll just note that. Uh, as per events, um, you know, there are a lot of student groups, fraternities, and sororities look to do things in different places. Um, the sophistication of licenses and fake licenses has just improved dramatically over the years. So um, I hope that you are, you are very ready for the fact that you can't just look at these. You can't just eyeball these and, uh, and uh, expect to be able to identify fake licenses. Um, the Campus and Community Coalition has a retails, retail partner uh, subcommittee. Doesn't meet very much these days, but, um, but uh, we can put you in touch with them. And uh, if you joined that subcommittee or, or you just got put on the mailing list, you would stay privy to, to really kind of what best practices are in, um, in, in that area, and uh, as well as different kinds of staff trainings that are available to, uh, to partners. So uh, that could be very helpful to you. It, it's, when we do meet, it's a good opportunity for different retailers to share their own experiences. Uh, it's so everyone kind of knows the, the state of the challenges of the moment out there. Okay, other questions or comments from public or select board before we close the public, public meeting? Dan, we're looking for a motion to close the public meeting at 7.01. So it has Second. been moved and seconded. All in favor of closing the public meeting at 7.01, uh, public hearing, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Time for deliberation. Select board. License, applicant, consideration. I uh, support this license for Hickory Ridge. You. I see no reason not to. Mr. Wall, thoughts? <laughs> okay, so uh, so I think that we all recognize that this is a uh, that that there has been this same use there in the past. It doesn't represent any significant change. Uh, you are well aware of the issues in a college town, and we don't think that this represents a particular new threat. And it will be also a uh, a, a benefit to the vitality of, of South Amherst to have Hickory Ridge up and running and thriving again. Uh, with its full consideration. So, Ms. Stein, if you'd like to make the motion. I would. I move that the select board approve the application of an MGL Chapter 138, Section 12, on-premise, all-alcohol restaurant annual liquor license to Hickory Ridge Grill, LLC, at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, on the premises described as a one-story frame building with dining area and lounge, on main level consisting of approximately 4,720 square feet. Liquor storage on same level, finished lower level consisting of approximately 2,703 square feet, open air cocktail deck plus patio area consisting of approximately 3,000 616 square feet, entire premises of 18 hole golf course containing three structures located in the vicinity of the sixth tee box, seventh tee box, and 17th tee box with service on the golf course to be made by beverage cart. William Rosenblum, manager of record. Is there a second? Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in. Good luck to you, and uh, we look forward to a thriving Hickory Ridge. Take care. Okay, our, we've got stuff to sign. Yes, you can give this to Mr. Musanti. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so our seven o'clock item is the Sustainability Festival and Arbor Day, two things closely related. We have Sustainability Coordinator Stephanie Ciccarello here to talk to us about this and uh, Department of Trees and 
I can't remember his title, Alan, Alan Snow, Snow here to talk to us about this also. Ms. Ciccarello, welcome. Thank you, good evening. Um, I'm here with my annual request and I apologize because I realized I didn't correct the request from last year. I recycle these because we always ask for the same number of parking spaces. <laughs> so it should actually be 21 parking spaces on Boltwood Avenue directly adjacent to the common. We need that entire line of parking because we have, for one thing, a textile drive where we're requesting that residents of the area, it doesn't have to be just Amherst residents, but residents of the area bring any old, used, clean and dry rags, clothing, textiles, anything that they have, blankets, sheets. Uh, they can bring them to the common and actually unload themselves of any unused textiles that they want to get rid of. And we'd be happy to take them off their hands. So we do have a truck that we will have parked there for residents to drive up and unload that, um, that material. And then we also have electric vehicles that will be on display as well. Uh, so we'll need parking spaces for that. And then we basically just need a lot of parking spaces for people to load and unload. We try to keep it flowing. Um, and we do have some vendors that will be with us that have difficulty with mobility. So we try to keep them, give them parking spaces adjacent to the common so that they don't have to go very far. Very good. Ms. Stein. Could you explain to me what you're going to do with the fabric? I, I noticed this ahead of time. I'm planning to give you some fabric, but I can't imagine I what the use of these torn items would be? I, you'd have to ask the recycling coordinator because all I know is that they receive them. I, I'm not even sure exactly what they do with them, but um, it's a better use of putting them in the landfill. So um, I'm not sure if some of the materials get used to make other materials. I'm not really sure what that process is. Uh, questions or comments about the re parking request for sustainability? Fair. Okay, why don't you make that motion, Ms. Stein, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the festival itself. Sure. I move that the select board approve the reservation of 22 metered parking spaces on the west side of Boltwood Avenue, adjacent to the town common between Spring Street and College Street, Route 9, on Saturday, April 27, 2013, from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. for display and vendor parking. And we're going to change that to 21 spaces, right? 21, correct. Yeah, 21. And also, if Sorry. we could have the meters bagged on Friday, April 26th, the night before, we would greatly appreciate that. The night before, okay. Uh, I'll second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded and amended, Ms. Brewer. Um, if Ms. Stein would fix the motion to show the name of the festival as well. We kind of dropped that when we wrote the motion. Okay. Just as a so title. To approve it for display and vendor parking of something. Yeah. It happens to be under the heading of sustainability all festival. Right. So, so let's put that right she, after. She's the spaces. one who fixes all the details. Yeah. We can so take care of that. Some to John, so. For the sustainability festival parking on the west side of Boltwood. Put this right in after spaces, maybe. Yeah, we can take care of You guys of that can part. work it out later. Okay. But you'll work it out. At the end of the motion, adding the phrase for okay. the sustainability festival. Works for me. All right, uh, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. So, a commercial about the festival. Itself. <laughs> so, this year we have, um, again, over 100 vendors. We've been very fortunate. We have a great mix of um, service providers, people who have um, sustainable goods and services, craft vendors, which is always fun and interesting to see what people do with upcycled materials. We have a great lineup of entertainment this year. We have someone from Australia, Charlie McGee, um, who's got a ukulele permaculture band or perhaps he's just playing his ukulele music but it's all environmental and sustainably themed um, which should be fun and we also have a great demonstration area this year we've expanded upon that last year um, it was focused a little more on local businesses but this year we wanted to make it more of an educational component to the event so we're really encouraging people to stop by the demonstration area where they can learn about composting they can learn about lasagna bed gardening they can learn why goat girls use goats to control invasive species. So there's a great educational component. And I also do want to mention the UMass Permaculture Group will also have um, a demonstration set up that day. So there's a lot to learn there as well. And it's family friendly. There'll be lots of booths and vendors that will um, have activities for children. We have face painting and we have the Orbitron. Of course, our event would never be the same without the Orbitron. So. Um, 
it's going to be a wonderful event this year, and we're just hoping that we have good weather. <laughs> Indeed. So that is Saturday, April 27th. Folks can get more information about that on the town website, right? Correct. And uh, there's a nice flyer that Ms. Stein mentioned about the textile recycling that talks about all the things that can be accepted and can't be accepted and whatever. So uh, that's very handy. And could I make one more plug for one more event? And I'm sorry, I know I'm not on the agenda for this, but um, we have a group called Grow Food Amherst, which is having an event here in Town Hall on Thursday, April 18th from 6 to 9 p.m. And it's a gardening 101 workshop, and we're encouraging 350 Amherst residents to sign on and grow food in town. It's going to be a fabulous workshop. We have a master gardener, Charlotte Vessel, who's going to lead a one-hour presentation. And then there'll be a Q&A session, followed by four workstations in the room where people can rotate and learn different aspects of gardening. So, And that's the first of three events. We have stuff happening at the Sustainability Festival, of course. And then on May 5th, there'll be a permaculture living classroom demonstration. And again, we'll have more information at Grow Food Amherst, which is growfoodamherst.org. People can find more information about those events as well. Terrific. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from Ms. Chicarella? All right. Then it's also Arbor Day that day, so uh, we have Mr. Snow. Did we vote on the sustainability? We did the parking. Yes. Okay. Hello. Welcome. So I'm here again to request uh, the annual Arbor Day proclamation from the select board. Uh, this will be uh, part of our 25th year of uh, 26th year of being a tree city usa for the town one of the requirements is to host an arbor day event uh, we're actually hosting two this year uh, we're going to be having the arbor day event at the sustainability festival um, where we hope to have the town bucket truck again um, we'll have tree planting demonstration and a, a young tree pruning demonstration how to properly prune a young tree um, but on the saturday on the friday before on the um what was it, the 26th, um, we'll be hosting an Arbor Day of Service as part of the Mass Arborist Association um, event that takes place on Arbor Day. And uh, we'll be inviting local businesses to participate, local tree care businesses, and uh, the Stocker School of Agriculture Climbing Lab to uh, prune trees on the South Amherst Common. Um, so they'll be volunteering their time to take care of some of our trees and, and plant some new trees as well on the South Amherst Common. So Wonderful. two good events this year. And so what date was that one again? That was on the 26th. The 26th, so that's the day before the sustainability test. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, questions or comments for Mr. Snow? This time, would you like to read the proclamation? No, I, I will, but I was gonna make a comment. Oh, you can do that, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say, I think this plant, tree planting questions and answer is really terrific. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad to see it. Um, is that posted somewhere online? It is. Thank you. That's um, on our, if you go to the uh, town webpage and you go to the Public Works Department, um, the Tree and Grounds um, Division, you'll see the reforestation page. And there's um, several documents there for residents. Okay. Um, they can download a form for permission to plant trees on their property on the setback. Um, right and uh, find about the trees and um, recontact if you want want a tree. So. Okay, now I'll read the proclamation. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the plant planting of trees, misspelled. This, unless they mean planting, do you know which it was? Um, this holiday, called Arbor Day, was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska, and whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world, and whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife, and whereas trees are a renewable resource, giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products. Trees in our town increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our community. And whereas trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal, and Amherst has been recognized as a Tree City USA 
by the National Arbor Day Foundation and desires to continue its tree planting ways. Now, therefore, we, the select board of the town of Amherst, do hereby proclaim April 27, 2013 as Arbor Day in the town of Amherst, and we urge all citizens to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and to support our town's urban forestry program. Second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so all in favor of that proclamation, say aye. 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 Unanimous. So that's lovely. It's a nice honor for Amherst. Um, and uh, we are proud to be a Tree City USA. So tell us more things about the tree planting plans. Um, I'm going to ask Amy Lane to come up, um, Assistant Superintendent of DBW. Um, so we gave you guys a little bit of a summary update of what's going on but since you guys so graciously gave us this um, money last year to have such a great tree planting plan we wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update on how that's going so um, so so far Alan's crew has um, last summer was really a summer of setting the groundwork getting the equipment that they needed um, they planted about 40 trees but really it was a time to look at where we need to be planting trees, get everything in motion so that this summer they can really um, start to make some headway. So we've only spent a little bit of the budget. Um, this year, he's a lot more aggressive with looking at how many trees. So we're hoping to plant 960 trees this summer. Very aggressive. Um, about 500 of these trees have been sighted. So um, just to residents that are listening, if they see a white circle in their front yard, that means that that's a place that we're looking at to plant a tree. Um, so Alan and his crew are looking very carefully now at contacting homeowners and um, you know making sure that people are aware of what's going on um, I believe that if the um, if the white circle is literally on their property then we are gonna have to get an agreement from them if it's within the town right-of-way even if it's in front of their property we'll try to inform them but it's it's on town land so um, we may or we don't have to actually get the agreement from them so um, certainly if people have questions and they see that white circle in front of their house um, they should certainly call in and they can talk to us about it um, we do want to recognize that Mike Olkin has done a tremendous job at providing a program that we've been using so that uh, we can use the GIS to look at where things are cited and we can be uploading information on the tree um, species and that sort of thing um, so that's been a tremendous help to us um, and so I guess this morning the two interns that we're gonna have working with us over the summer have started uh, they're both students at the Stockbridge School um, they're both local kids as well um, so that's fantastic and um, already we've been getting them updated on what we're looking at how to just interpret the information and how to um, I guess hit the ground running with planting some trees soon. Um, Amherst Nursery won the bid to be selling us all the trees. So again, um, we're glad to be promoting a local company. Uh, so a contract is pending, that's in the works, but we just did the bid opening for that last week. And then in terms of supplies, as you can see, uh, luckily we've been able to keep everything very local. So Wagner Wood is reprocessing our wood chip pile. Um, Wysocki Farm is uh, screening all the material, and then the loam is supplied by R.H. Roberts. Um, so, um, and this is all in the summary, but I think, did I hit most of the highlights? Okay. Um, and then, as, um, as we gave you as well, we do have the question and answer, answer page if anybody has questions about um, how this is going to work or, you know, what our responsibilities are going to be, how we're going to take care of the, the trees the first few years. Um, if people are interested, certainly there's a form where you can apply and say, I think I want a tree in my front yard. Um, can you please evaluate and see if this is an appropriate location? Um, and then, again, if people have a, a preference as to what tree, we'll certainly take that into consideration, but they are employing the um, right tree, right place. Um, aesthetics there so they'll be making sure that it is the right tree for the location but all this information is on the the website under trees and ground so people should certainly look there for more information wonderful that's very exciting thank you very much questions or comments from the select board 
Well, we are just going to look forward to 900 and something new trees this summer then. That's just this summer, 2,000 trees total. So Incredible. Very exciting. Incredible. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, for informing the public about that. I'll bet you'll be getting phone calls about folks who are looking to get on the tree list. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next item is farmer's market parking request and information for the upcoming season. We have Mr. Spinetti here to talk to us about this. And we received uh, your annual request, which is in our packets. Welcome. <laughs> and just identify yourself for folks at home, please. Sure. Uh, I'm John Spinetti. I'm president of the Amherst Farmer's Market Committee. I've been with the market all its years, and this is our 42nd season. Wonderful. And so you are looking to start again on April 20th? April 20th. Last year, the opening day was my best sales day of the whole year. Hard to believe. But people were raring to get out there. This year, you're going to be opening along with the Extravaganza Festival. So yes, I I'm not that. sure what that's going to that. do. <laughs> it could be interesting. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, during public comment earlier, Mr. Brennan talked about some of the progress that has been made in discussions with the Agricultural Commission and, um, and the Farmers Market Committee. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to talk about some of the changes that sure. are being I, put into effect Yes, this year? I would. Uh, last year, you asked what the market could do for the Amherst farmers. And we've actually added four new Amherst farmers to the membership of the market. They include Choice Farms. Wentworth Farms, Queens Greens, and J&J and &J Farms. Um, I think all of these farms will actually be a great addition, and I invite all the area um, people to come to, uh, invited to, to uh, greet these people at the market, uh, the new farms, and to, uh, to talk with them. So there are continuing negotiations going on with local farmers for for additional expansion for the future? Well, yes, we've uh, talked to a uh, uh, town manager and said essentially that we will be looking at possible expansion in the future as needed. Uh, we do have a lot of produce in the market, and that was my point I make all along, is that we have two to three times the amount of produce that sells at the market, and consequently that really you know, limits what we want to have of a certain type of produce so supply and demand really does limit what we should do in terms of expansion. We try to diversify, and we diversified into all areas, including dairy of all sorts, including cheeses, butter, uh, yogurt. Uh, and that really brings a lot of production in terms of farmland, because the dairy farms utilize most of the farmland in terms of per unit farmer. And uh, I, I think that other areas that we're looking at, we're looking at a winery Mount Warner Winery over the hill here on Mount Warner Road, I think that brings diversity to the market. Um, we have four people selling meats at the market, uh, everything from chicken to turkey to lamb, beef, uh, even goat meat. So uh, effectively, we have tried to cover every base within the current footprint of the market. Um, I don't think we lack anything in terms of diversity. Uh, without going into prepared foods, which people would not essentially be bringing from their farms. Uh, being a Class A market, we limit our market to produce that's produced on the farm. That no one can buy and resell at the market. So that really does make it a very unique market over the years. Uh, there are several Class A markets in the Valley. They include the Northampton Saturday market as well as the Florence market. And this really distinguishes our market as one of the, the best of that type. So there, there has been continuing concern over the years, as you're well aware, right. um, of the ability for Amherst farmers to, um, mm -hmm. to present there. And you and I had had a conversation last year that you said you thought you could accommodate all of the Amherst farmers that yes. wanted to yes, participate. Yes, Yes. Um, so that I, it seems like that isn't the case, that there are still farmers who want to participate who aren't there, being there accommodated. Are, not to my knowledge. Okay. I, I mean, I could be mistaken, but I, not to my knowledge. I, I believe we have spoken, and it was difficult to find these Amherst farmers. We sent representatives of our Farmers Market Committee to these farms to talk with the farmers to see if they wished to come into the market. Um, if they couldn't find the market, it was beyond me, so, and I haven't heard from anyone else other than the ones I just mentioned. Okay. We, we opened it up through the, uh, there's several avenues we took an approach. We, we have a website. 
We also utilize the Agricultural Commission's email list to search out farmers. We have several representatives from the Ag Commission present and past. They include Jeremy Barker Plotkin, who has been a liaison, uh, Casey uh, 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 from Old Friends Farm, and even uh, uh, Sunset Farm, Connie Gillen. Uh, all these people are in town as farmers and it's been hard for them to find farmers from Amherst who wish to come into the market. They're either perhaps either too large or not interested in marketing at the farmer's market. But I, I know of no others. Okay. Um, so th this isn't a good venue for us to, no, no, to, I, to I work agree. all right. of this stuff I, I didn't, out. I didn't intend to, to, to yeah, do that. No, well, yeah, well, the point needs to be raised because um, you are operating on right. town property uh, in the town of Amherst, and so right. there is a need to make sure that Amherst farmers in right. particular are accommodated there. Um, and there is the ability to expand the market to accommodate those vendors. Um, all of those things need to be looked into because this has been kind mm -hmm. of a continuing issue through the year. So um, I appreciate the conversations are ongoing with the Agricultural Commission. Um, we encourage those conversations to continue. Um, and I hope that, uh, that people continue to, mm -hmm. to find progress in all of this going forward because everyone wants a thriving farmers market uh, there that's a that's a special market to the town Thank you. Um, and uh, as such it's uh, it will be even more special with more Amherst farmers so um, Ms. Stein is our I, I was just trying to support what you were saying as liaison to the Ag Commission and I know of one Amherst farmer who felt very shut out even this year so um, I, I hope that um, more progress will be made to be inclusive and i wonder if you've come to the winter market which yes i was a member it's it's really very exciting mm -hmm. and lively and i think that i'd like to see that kind of liveliness um there's some i mean i'm not saying the, the summer market is is you know bereft of of liveliness because I'm not I like it right. but um, I do think there is a certain charm to the winter's market that I'd like to see mm -hmm. through the summer market too but anyway I know I do know of one unhappy Amherst farmer so um, I hope we can continue to make progress along the lines that Stephanie mentioned okay thank you Ms. Brewer it's simply that um, I appreciate that you've been doing this for a really long time and you are looking at what makes sense for the farmers who are already there as well as farmers who want to come in because obviously you don't want the balance to be disrupted in some fashion that would not be beneficial to the farmers as well um, it just has to be perceived building on what other people are saying it has to be perceived as more of an open system than it has been in the past and it sounds like it is being this year with with um some there has been progress in that area because again it's town property we can't have one of the things that's actually most important not only to our farmers but also to our community members as being like this wonderful amherst resource and then people feeling as though there's some sense that it's a closed venue that they you know you have to be a certain person or whatever to get into it so i i, I appreciate that you're taking that into account and that you're really thinking about that mm -hmm. so that we don't have to struggle with this decision on a yearly basis that we that we're hearing back from people that yep they you know they had the opportunity to talk about it and for whatever reason it may or may not have worked out but as long as people have their opportunity sure. to uh, do so it should be all right so I, th I think you're hearing pretty strongly that the select board wants it to be more open and inclusive. Um, as uh, you and I discussed last year, the, uh, the select board isn't in the business of limiting competition. So I understand right. you've got competitive issues going on within your market and the, the desire to not have redundancy or whatever. Um, but for the, from the select board's perspective, what we're doing is giving up um, public space, not just regular public space, but parking space for, for all of our other downtown businesses. Um, so it, uh, it, it needs to be able to accommodate Amherst farmers as much as Amherst farmers need want to be able to be there. So, um, so I, I do appreciate that the conversations are ongoing. What we're hearing from AgCom from AgCom members is that those conversations keep needing to happen. So I hope that I hope that, um, that, that 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 really does continue to make progress. Mr. Musanti. Yeah, I would just add in, in my own uh, discussions with AgCom representatives and uh, John and other representatives of the. Uh, farmers market I mean the Amherst farmers market is a very important part of the economic vitality of our downtown uh, there has been some progress this year you know with the uh, 
freeing up of some of the existing stalls, uh, allowing the four additional Amherst farmers to participate in the market. We think that's a very positive uh, step. Uh, and there's been some progress on transparency, make having more of the farmers aware of what the various uh, rules and regulations and guidelines are for consideration for participation. Um, but that there's some additional work that needs to be done. We've, we've had some preliminary discussions about uh, governance and about possibly working collaboratively with the market to uh, pursue grant funding to look at whether it's USDA, rural development, or common capital, or uh, agency like that, looking at mm -hmm. uh, long-term, short-term and long-term strategies. And so, yeah, I would just underscore how important it is to have that ongoing dialogue be substantive and, and with real, uh, real progress so that we can pursue ways to sustain the market and have it uh, grow and be even more successful than it already is. Uh, anyone else like to comment on this before we make the parking motion? Okay, Ms. Stein. I move that the select board approve the closure of that section of Spring Street within the Spring Street parking lot each Saturday from April 20th, 2013 to November 23rd, 2013 from 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. for the Amherst Farmers Market. Our second. Second. Thank you. <laughs> We're also set in our ways. <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, for the discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That is I unanimous. I move that the select board approve the reservation of the first five metered parking spaces on the east side of South Pleasant Street originating at Spring Street, moving south towards College Street on each Saturday beginning April 27, 2013 to November 23rd, 2013, from 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. for the Amherst Farmers Market. And on Saturday, April 20th, 20, 20, 2013, the reservation of the first five metered parking spaces on the east side of South Pleasant Street between the Main Street and the Spring Street parking lots from 7 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Thank Second you. for the discussion, Ms. Brewer. Would you please explain that in words again? <laughs> <laughs> different words <laughs> that explain Me? why it is that it has to be different on the 20th, the opening day and extravaganza oh. parking. And I know we haven't done extravaganza parking yet, but that's why this is like this. So what was the simple answer to why it's like that again? Because I'm confused. I don't know what the special ones are about, but clearly it's to accommodate special circumstances on those days. So don't sweat it. All right. <laughs> Works for me. Okay. Good. Uh, further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. We look forward to the market. Thank you. On Take care. Of the farm. Thanks. Okay. Next up, we have, ah, uh, yes, tis the season. Town meeting season is beginning. <laughs> And so this is the first of four consecutive select board meetings where we will be taking positions on the town meeting warrant articles. We have on our desks tonight a, uh, an updated warrant. The warrant is now um, on the select board's web packet for this meeting for folks who are watching at home. I'm not sure if it's any place else on the website, but if it isn't, but probably not because we haven't signed it yet. So tomorrow after we sign it, it will be on the uh, town meeting warrant page uh, as well. Um, the only difference to the warrant from what you had received in your uh, packet on Friday is that we're still finishing out the, the very last details of the wording on the rental regulations bylaw, which is Article 29. Um, so that is, that, that is the only difference. Is that right? Yeah, from Friday. Um, so tonight we've got uh, about a dozen-ish articles in front of us. We are trying to... Um, start with the kind of the easy ones. Uh, the packet deadline for materials for the first town meeting mailing is today. So we wanted to be able to deal with articles after we had the, more, uh, the packet materials for them. So most packet materials are not yet ready. Um, I will note that we had been planning to have the rental regulations 
um, consideration, taking the position on that at the next meeting. But because of the packet deadlines, uh, that's actually going to be on the 22nd because all the rental regulations materials are going to be in that second mailing, which has a deadline of the 23rd. So without further ado, um, we have in our packets a very, very helpful explanation of a bunch of the warrant articles that we are doing this evening. These are ones that many of us could recite in our sleep for having done this for a very long time. Um, but there are always new uh, town meeting members watching this meeting or folks who are considering getting involved with town meeting. So, uh, so we do try and give a little bit of an explanation for each of these so folks know what we're talking about. Um, but I would direct folks' attention to this very helpful memo uh, from Finance Director Sandy Pooler to Mr. Musanti, and that is the explanation of different articles. So to starting at the very beginning, we have the reports of boards and committees, which we all know is, uh, is a procedural motion that we have to vote to accept, uh, to hear, we vote to hear the reports of boards and committees that are not submitted in written form, and that is a technicality that we do every time. So questions or comments about Article 1? And uh, are you going to do assignments? now i mean yeah. we don't have an assignment sheet yet mm -hmm. we don't have an assignment we'll, sheet we'll yet. keep track of them don't worry okay um so would you like to make the motion on then i don't article have one? to i would be happy to speak to article one um you want me to read it as a motion i yes. got it i just have lost the motion sheet hang on for a minute okay top of the next page yeah i know so i just have to turn the page I move that the select board recommend to the May 6th, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 1, reports of boards and committees. Come on, folks. Second. Thank you. <laughs> All for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Um, I would be happy to speak to it. That, that's fine. I'm not going to take <laughs> it away from Don't you. Don't take it away from Ms. Stein will I'll speak to it. Ms. Brewer. Away from you. Um, I wonder if the town, if it's appropriate for the town manager, if he would be willing to let the wonderful staff that we have, many of which are liaisons to many, many, many committees, um, to remind them that this is an available spot for people who, for committees to report out because it often happens that they realize that, you know, at the last second, oh, wait, that would have been a good idea. And it doesn't have to go in the mailing. I mean, it's nice if they have a handout and they can put it on the floor that night. It doesn't have to be in the packet. It could be in the packet. It's supposed but to also, be ones that aren't available in written form anyway. But, <laughs> but people do do it the other way as well. So, But just to remind people of the availability of it because sometimes they forget. Okay, Article 2 is transfer of funds, unpaid bills. We always need to transfer funds uh, if we have any unpaid bills and if the, the recommendation would be to do so. Um, uh, these are unpaid bills from previous years. The recommendation would be to do so if we have any and to dismiss this article if we do not. Questions or comments on Article 2? Oh, then Ms. Stein. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6th, 2013 annual town meeting article two, transfer of funds, unpaid bills. And if we could just amend that to be, or dismiss. If or dismiss. As necessary. Okay. Hopefully we move it All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. And I would be happy to talk to that one too. Stein. All just right. have to mark what I'm doing. Is that okay? Yep, sure. All right. Yeah. Article three is optional tax exemptions. This is something that town meeting needs to reapprove every year. These are optional tax exemptions that are available to uh, the elderly, blind folks, um, veterans, and uh, surviving spouses, a couple of other categories perhaps. Uh, it has been adopted by town meeting for many, many years. It needs to be readopted every year to give the additional exemption up to 100% of the available exemption and that um, that tax uh, amount is covered by the um, by the overlay that is set aside uh, every year for the purpose of abatements and exemptions. 
questions, comments? <laughs> Ms. Brewer. I was just going to mention again for the folks at home that in addition to the warrant, which just has the, the basic words on it that sounds so delightful, um, the explanation of many of these articles is also available in the web packet for those of you who yes. don't just know what that automatically mm -hmm. means. All right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion on that? I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 3, acceptance of optional tax exemptions. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, that's unanimous. Ms. Stein, would you like to do the, the next one? I move. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, did oh, you yeah, want to sure. speak to Article yeah, 3? Sure. Until somebody speaks up and says, say, I'm just going to sit there all the town meeting <laughs> and, uh, and let you talk. It's no, I, these are easy. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave the hard ones for other people. So the I'm, next, oh, we're going to, we got to talk to this one first. So um, talk about four. article four, this is actually a new one. So this is optional tax work off exemption for veterans. So just like we have the um, senior tax work off program, uh, whereby seniors are able to work a certain number of hours to uh, offset, is it $1,000 of their taxes? Um, there is a new mass general law that allows for veterans to qualify for this, the same sort of work off. Um, this needs to be approved once by town meeting. We need to adopt the new state uh, law that allows us to do this. We would not need to reapprove this every year as we did the previous um, tax exemption one. But, so this is a new one for town meeting to consider. Questions or comments about this one? Ms. Stein. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting Article 4, acceptance of optional tax work off exemption for veterans. Further discussion, Ms. Brewer. The only thing I would ask is that um, perhaps it could be mentioned at town meeting that um, just as we've talked about the slots for our other work off programs in the past, and okay, we so we adjust the number of hours and the number of dollars. And if this becomes a popular program, that we will be that somebody will say something in the intervening time before the next town meeting, so that we're kind of prepared for it. But it, you know, it's brand new to us now; it's very exciting, and so um, hopefully it'll get a lot of use. But we know I, I don't like when we're in the position of oh gee, we wish we could help you out too, but you're just the 75th person, and too bad for you. Um, so it's just nice when we have a little bit of a heads up knowing about that. But I know that it's been very well managed in the other programs as well. So, so you mentioned before the next town meeting. Um, so I, I just want to emphasize again that town meeting, this isn't going to come back to town meeting right. again if it gets approved. Right. This is true, but it would come, it could come up if there's, you know, this is one of the, the kind of thing where somebody stands up and says, I wasn't able to do it. Um, so just at some point in the process, if right. it becomes an issue is all I ask. So just like with the senior tax with work the, off program, exactly. that, has to, that exactly. comes to us periodically when the numbers need to be changed, exactly. either the, the uh, hourly rate that qualifies or the hours. So what I should have said was, just as we periodically revisit, even though town meeting doesn't have to look at it annually, it's good for us to be aware when there is a, uh, if there is um, a challenge brewing right. so that we can deal with it. I think, I think, um, what we expect, assuming town meeting supports this, um, you could expect staff and I to come back to the select board sometime soon after town meeting with a formal recommendation about okay. the number of, of slots for this new program. And then it would make sense prior to next spring, giving okay. you an update of how it went. Yes, yeah. exactly. And similarly, that is uh, th that exemption is paid for through the uh, overlay uh, reserve that is set aside one percent uh, to cover exemptions and abatements. All right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? Sure. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article Four, acceptance of optional tax work off exemption for veterans. Second. For the discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Next one, compensating balances. Everyone's favorite. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Who would like to speak to the new veterans? I exemption? would. Ms. Brewer. There you go. See, I get one. You do. You have them all. All right. All right. Yeah. So now it's compensating balances. This is the one we do every year, even though this has never happened in the history of anyone's memory. And I think that Mr. Musanti puts it on there just to plague us. But anyway, this is, uh, this is uh, <laughs> the... Um, permission that we need to grant to the treasurer uh, 
collector every year to engage in banking relationships for which the town may get a better interest rate in exchange for keeping a certain balance in the in the account so and because if we didn't approve it it could be considered an uh, appropriation without a um, what do you call it? Appropriation it's a, it's a, it would be considered an expenditure without an appropriation, appropriation. vote. You. And so this gives the flex, flexibility to the treasurer that if such a uh, proposal was made to her and she felt it was in the best interest financially to the town to do it, this would give her the flexibility to enter into such an agreement. So just I'll belabor this since this article. I've never found such an instance yet. <laughs> It's good to have the flexibility. But we're prepared. So what exactly would be the expenditure on the town's part? I don't understand that. So you keep a certain, if you meet a certain minimum balance, then they're going to give you a better interest rate. But you're not expending anything. It's the moving of monies into, into an account. It can be considered an expenditure, even though it's not really. <laughs> if you're going to keep putting it on the warrant, I'm going to yes. keep asking you annoying questions about it. Okay. I don't need to understand it. We just need to approve it. <laughs> Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I sure would. I move that the select board recommend the May 6th annual town meeting, Article 5, authorization for compensating balances. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Who would like to speak to that? You would, Stephanie. <laughs> no, I would. <laughs> I will. Ms. Brewer, all right. Oh, yes. I'll say Ms. Stephanie said Ms. Stephanie's <laughs> favorite article. Okay, <laughs> Article 14 is the retirement assessment. Am I going in the right order? Right. Except it's numbered Different sheets of paper here. Compensating balances. On the agenda there. Oh, okay, that's my problem. All right, retirement assessment. So uh, we are part of the Hampshire County retirement system. They uh, give us an assessment of what is owed for the pensions for our, uh, our retirees through the Hampshire County system. And this year it is just under $4 million. And this is one of those things that we have to approve. So we have to approve it. Questions or comments? Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? I'm just having a little um, conflict here between, yes, between what memos. we were handed, but I think I understand. This memo is misnumbered. Yeah. Our memo from that April explains 4th. is labeled 14, but it's really 13. It's really 13. And so now I can make the motion. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6th 2013 annual town meeting article 13 retirement assessment. Ms. Brewer, would you like to second Yes. That? Thank you. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Only if I get to do lockup next. <laughs> okay, are you? So you'll do, speak, you'll do the retirement? Yes. Okay. okay, so she's going to do 13, and she's going to do the next one. All right, the next one about. is the regional lockup assessment. So uh, this is another one that we have to pay to the county because we just have to. This uh, is the regional lockup, which was established, um, I don't know, seven or eight years ago now. Um, and all of the towns in the county that actually send their prisoners to this lockup pay a percentage of its costs. My understanding is that our costs are unchanged That's since right. this began. We, we pay based on population, and for whatever reason, they're using our uh, 2005 population. So um, that was very intriguing. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but. That's fine for us. So that uh, that assessment comes to just over thirty-one thousand dollars for FY14. Ms. Stein, I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 14, regional lockup assessment. And second, again, our handout is mislabeled. And moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Ms. Brewer has already identified that yes. as one she'd like to one speak of her to. Favorites. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to write that down. Okay. Next up, we have the reserve fund. This is the Finance Committee's reserve fund. We have for many years, except for one year that we didn't, um, voted the uh, sum of uh, $100,000 to them. At one point, it was reduced, but then they had to increase it anyway. Um, this is money that they have authority over for unex 
unexpected budgetary circumstances during the year, typically it goes to pay for um, overages in snow and ice or overtime uh, public safety. Is that correct? Okay. Same every year. We just do it every year. Ms. Stein. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 17 reserve fund, and I would be happy to speak to that. Unless uh, Jim would like to. First, we need a second. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Ms. Stein would like it. Mr. Wald yields to Ms. Stein on the reserve fund. Okay. All right. Next up, we have revolving fund reauthorization. So this was established last year um, when we created the new after school program, uh, when, we, when we changed the structure of the after school program between the schools and LSSE. Uh, and in order to do so, that required the establishment of a revolving fund to handle those, uh, those fees that are paid to it and out of it. Um, so this is something that requires reauthorization every year as we were told about last year when we established it. And so this is the technical, uh, reauthorization of that account. Questions, comments, Ms. Burr? So this is not the only revolving fund we have, but it's right. the only revolving fund we have that we have to reauthorize every year. Yes. Correct. Exactly. Yep. Apparently there are other ones of these. Um, Town Council was mentioning this the other day when we were talking about them. Um, that is, this is called, this has the lovely MGL designation of 53 E and a half, whatever <laughs> the half might mean. But As I, opposed to other revolving funds that we have that are chapter 53, uh, section 53D. Nice solid letter. <laughs> <laughs> Here we have E and a half. So this is our only E and a half, 53 E and a half revolving fund. Um, okay. Any other questions or comments about this? Uh, just, uh, we think it's been a very successful first year on the after school programming uh, in partnership with LSSC and the Amherst Public Schools and I would like to have staff come in and give you an update, perhaps with Superintendent Garrick and I, some point before the end of the fiscal year. That's a good idea. About this program. Yep, thank you. Good. Okay, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 18, <laughs> revolving fund reauthorization. And I point out the numbering on this is all off all the way through, John. But yeah, the memo was written uh, when we were working probably. with an earlier draft warrant. Sure. Uh, and we we right. uh, took out one article as no longer needed and right. it changed the numbers of the remaining. Right. Yeah. I just wonder if it should be corrected for posting it, online. That would be uh, nice. yeah, I was going to ask idea. that if we just revise it, Sorry. if we, <laughs> that exact thing, so we can just say revised to renumbering. You know, just so to show that no, there's no <laughs> substantive sure. change. Yeah. But yeah, people can reference it because it's so helpful. Exactly. Okay, we've had the motion. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I'll aye. be happy to speak to it unless Diane's going to wrestle me. Brewer will speak to it. Uh oh, I lost track. Who took the reserve fund? Finance Committee Reserve, that was Ms. Stein, thank you. Diana, she wanted that one. That's right, and now Ms. Brewer. Okay, <laughs> next up. Uh, so we have one on the memo that's not on our agenda tonight, so we're gonna leave that until next time. This is a capital program debt rescission. I'm not sure how that ended up on here, but just in case anyone would be tuning in specifically to see us take our position on debt rescission, we will save that good information, good explanation for when we deal with that some other time. Um, so then the next one is Article 25, which is social services funding. And um, we have information in our packets from the town manager about this. This is uh, what the select board had previously supported as the community development block grant recommendation and transition plan. Um, there is information, as I mentioned, in the web packet about this. Mr. McCanty, would you like to summarize uh, that? Yeah, and this is consistent with uh, recommendations uh, I made in my FY14 budget recommendations all the way back in January, and then that uh, we were looking at a uh, highly likely uh, reduction, if not outright elimination, of our CDBG funding with the loss of our status as a mini entitlement community uh, with follow-up conversations with uh, 
state uh, officials, uh, we think our new worst case scenario is loss of half of our CDBG funding. Uh, in that scenario, uh, the social services portion of the CDBG funding would would be reduced from 180,000 in the current year to 90,000 from CDBG in the upcoming year. So the intent of this article is to supplement what we think is the likely CDBG amount of 90,000 with an additional 90,000 uh, funded from town reserves free cash to allow uh, level funding of, of social service uh, funding uh, uh, for the upcoming year. And I've included in your meeting packet that's posted online a copy of my recommendations uh, to the select board dated February 8th that we considered at that meeting when we were about to submit the CDBG application. And included on that is uh, a summary of recommendations uh, from our CDBG advisory committee who met at length with all the various uh, social services applicants and developed a prioritized list of recommendations for me. Um, um, and on the back side of that memo is uh, in shaded in blue are my uh, suggested recommendations that were endorsed, uh, prioritized recommendations that were endorsed by the select board back in February. And I would call your attention to the, uh, the column there. It basically, uh, in the scenario where CDBG money would be cut in half, uh, that would leave us with 90,000. Uh, the recommendation from CDBG advisory, uh, or from myself, that you endorsed in our application was that the first 90,000 of funding uh, would go toward the uh, uh, emergency shelter. Craig's door shelter at First Baptist Church. Um, and then in priority order, there's a, there's a, a handful of agencies that would receive the remaining uh, 90,000. Pretty much, I mean, my recommendation to you that was endorsed was trying to do that in, pr in priority order going down the list. Thank you. And so your- Whatever available dollars we had. And so your recommendation to us was consistent with the select board's uh, budget policy guidelines, asking, making sure that your budget plans were going to keep whole for this year, the social services funding, uh, considering the transition of the, uh, the, the CDBG eligibility at that time as we look to the future for a funding plan. So this is uh, a recommendation for up to $90,000 to come from reserves as, uh, as we say often, a, a bridge to a plan uh, because we don't know what the plan will be for the future. Um, so before we take a position on this, well, actually I'll have questions and comments from the select board to the town manager, and then, um, then I think it makes the most sense to have um, Ms. Greeny is here who has a petition article that is looking for uh, a different way of, of expending that money. So first, is there any questions or comments on Mr. Musanti's recommendation? Ms. Brewer. I just want to clarify because I haven't looked at this again in a sure. while. And so... If we don't get anything from the state, which would be weird, but if we didn't get anything, which is the position we were in when before we asked for um, transition funding and yep. an additional app, then we would, and we won't know this for months yet. So what we would then do is if this article passes town meeting, we would put that 90,000 all toward Craig's doors. That's my recommendation. That would be the recommendation. We certainly hope that right. the worst case scenario with the state is not zero, but in fact 90,000, in which case we would then have the 90,000 for Craig stores and then for the other agencies that you've listed here as your priorities. Yes. Items two through five, which are quite we similar, but not exactly. We actually be able to get down exactly. to number six to get up to a grand total of 180,000. Because this says 160 again, because we forgot to fix that. <laughs> Yeah, that math thing. Yeah, we'd have a grand total of 180,000 right. available in that. Exactly. To allow us to uh, do the rental assistance monies. Okay, so you'd pull over. I'm confused. I would take number six on the list. Okay, from from to get from up to the non-shaded one. Yes. Would get us the rest of the way. Okay. 
show me. He'd go from the white chart over here mm -hmm. all the way across because there was no six in green or blue. Okay. okay. Other questions or comments from Ms. Bisanti? Okay. So as I said, um, Ms. Greeny has a petition article that, uh, as I understand, is looking to um, to change the distribution potentially of those extra funds. So I think it makes it makes the most sense to hear her petition her, her petition. Um, recommendation before we take a position on one. So Ms. Greeny, if you'd like to come forward, introduce yourself and tell us about your plan. And I'll just note that this information is also in our packet and available on our web packet online. And before she does that, it's actually which warrant article again? It's article 45. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure, I got my numbering right. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, entertaining our petition article. My name is Wayling Greeny. I am the chair of the uh, Housing for All Citizens group. And uh, first of all, we want to thank the select board and town manager this year in particular for funding uh, social services, um, given the shortfall that we are anticipating from the uh, CDBG uh, you know, funding cut. So that's really something we want to express from our heart thank you for thinking about the social service projects. And um, given this fund, uh, $90,000 that the town manager is proposing is coming from the town's um, coffer. So we feel um, the town meeting uh, need to have a say in um, what uh, the eligibilities are. And, uh, you know, so we feel that um, short of having a formal process this year, that since we don't have the um, social service funding committee anymore, or in past years we also had the community development committee, which also uh, review social service projects that came to the town. So in light of the fact that we don't have that committee, so our Housing for All uh, proposed to town meeting to consider um, given the funds are from the town, not from the CDBG. So while we are deliberating what projects to support, um, the Housing for All feels strongly that um, we should fund all the uh, projects submitted uh, last fall for the CDBG application and uh, the funding for these uh, eight projects, not including Quake's Doors Shelter, given that seems to be very likely be funded by the um, reduced CDBG funds. So there are remaining eight projects. So Housing for All would like to encourage um, the select board, the select board and the town manager and the town meeting to consider um, the equitable funding of the other eight projects not uh, be funded by the CDBG social service funding. And uh, our biggest reason for uh, suggesting this is that we want to be mindful of asking the select board, given that we are no longer uh, many entitlement eligible as a community, that keep your eyes um, open in a sense that when we come up with this same problem next year, let's have a due process that a process that will address the fact that, you know, um, we are no longer CDBG mini entitlement eligible. So what is the process? So this year, because we don't have the process, so short of saying, uh, you know, let's not fund social service, which is not a good idea, that let's fund all those projects, eight of them have been submitted uh, to, to to the CDBG uh, committee. And uh, in our opinion, that each of these projects play an important role. In particular, we believe that um, given the priorities the town have laid out in the past, uh, four of them, such as the homelessness and the sheltering and the youth development and after school care and the adult education and job training. And lastly, but not the least, is for the emergency and preventive uh, services. All these eight projects submitted, they were all mindful, submitted with these goals in mind. So it's our opinion 
that um, when the town meeting appropriate funds, we encourage the town meeting to consider funding all these projects, understanding it's imperfect, but short of having a formal process to screen, to evaluate like what we have been doing in the past, we want to ask the town meeting to consider funding all these eight projects uh, submitted last year. And one last thing I want to uh, uh, bring it up is that in the past, our historical approach has been that, um, for example, in the documents submitted to the select board, we noticed that um, the funds, you know, appropriate by town meeting in the past uh, has ranged from $66,000 all the way up to $153,000 uh, since 1992 in these um, 20, 30 years period. And the number of agencies funded during those period when we were funding that amount, ranging from the most recent one before we cut the entire human service funding, was at least seven agencies. And there were times when we fund as many as 17 agencies. And this information are all included in the uh, sheet that we supplied to you last Friday. So it seems to be the town meeting's um, tradition to fund as many agencies that's eligible, that they are good quality service that serve our town's residents. So given the, tr the, the tradition, you know, we don't just fund what the CDBG says, we can only fund up to five. After all, this is not a CDBG funding, rather it's a town appropriate funds. Thank okay. you. So thank you very much for your um, entertaining this article. Um, I so appreciate that. And uh, given it's really tied to the article 25, so I wonder if Select Board will consider maybe it's more appropriate that for Housing for All to make a, a motion to amend this article rather than waiting until the end. That will you know, make it difficult for the connectedness of these two articles. So would you consider that actually, you know, we could come and make the amendment on the town meeting floor and we have not met to discuss this possibility, but I want to give you a heads up that we might consider to make an amendment when uh, the article 25 is being discussed that we will make an amendment to the effect that will cover article 45. Okay, so you should coordinate that with the moderator yes. um, before the meeting, and, and he's the one who can rule on that. Um, okay, so uh, as Ms. Greeny noted, the, the community development block grant funds are limited to funding on, uh, only five agencies. So her proposal, because it wouldn't be limited by community development block grants, um, strictures, it could then be divided up into more agencies than that. Um, so questions or comments for Ms. Greeny? Ms. Brewer. Um, this is going to stray a little bit, Article 25, you know, and Article so 45, related, so because they're related. Um, one of the things that I hope will be made clear when we present Article 25 to town meeting it starts out as a finance committee article, but obviously it will be a number of positions associated with it, is that Article 25 is in no way, shape, or fashion an intention to return the human services line items to the budget that were previously in the budget. We made that very clear in our discussion with the town manager before, when, when we set forth our goals for the year knowing that block grant funding was at risk, we specifically asked that he not consider it a simple return to the way we used to do things. So I'm a little concerned about what I see as an oversimplification associated with Article 45, which is, well, we don't have an appropriations type group anymore associated with this, with the various names that we've used for it over the years, Human Services Funding, Community Development Committee, later becoming the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee. Um, the applications were turned in under conditions that they knew that five applicants only would be done. I'm not sure how it might change the nature of the applications had they expected to be able to compete for a larger source of money. Um, when you know that there are only five agencies that can get funded, you as a human service agency might very well decide, I'm not going to apply. That doesn't mean that they wouldn't have had a very worthy project that were there to be some sort of arbitrator group that they would decide was in fact more important than one of these other eight things because the circumstances were different, 
for block grant applications. So I think it's unfortunate to just, I, I think it's an oversimplification to approach it this way. Um, in terms of the material that's been provided to us, I will once again state, as I have stated every single time that Ms. Greeny has appealed bef appeared before us associated with Housing for All, that I find it extremely frustrating that Housing for All is never identified as to who these people are that are on the committee. And I know you say citizen group, but every other group that talks to town meeting either identifies as individuals, identifies as a town committee, identifies as some group that has identified itself and lists the members of the group. You have continuously utterly refused to provide that information and it's not on this piece of paper either so I would strongly suggest that you consider providing that to town meeting especially in light of the fact that you are in fact in charge of one of the agencies that is asking for funding and you in no way mention this anywhere on this paper that you are in fact requesting money for services that you provide personally as well as heading up the very valuable work that Housing for All does. I find this a very unfortunate thing that many, many new town meeting members would not understand. It would not understand the reasoning behind not providing that information. Ms. Greeny. Uh, actually, when we submitted the uh, petition, we listed on the petition, uh, we submitted of the members that they are officers. It was in our, uh, petition we listed when we listed the um town meeting doesn't have access yeah. to the petition beyond going to the town so clerk's office to look you for like it. to have that we are happy because in the last year when we submitted an article to request for social service funding we listed in our petition you know uh information sheet for town packet for town meeting packet mm -hmm. we listed um, the officers they are already so that's yes. what we did last year so after several requests yes um, and I would okay. like to so see that I, done here as we, well we don't need to belabor that yeah. point so if, if you'd like more information about yes. that then perhaps uh, we will be happy to supply that, that information in no way we you know uh, want to, to keep this as a secret at all it's a public meeting and we post the meeting at the uh, library website every single time when we have the meeting, so it's there. And when we communicate with the select board, we use our uh, citizens for all letterhead. It lists the officer's name as well. So I believe that we have cooperated with the select board too. And as Thank far you. as that, the uh, our my agency, Amherst Community Connections, is part of the project submitted to the town. This article does not specifically address that the town just fund Amherst Community Connections. Rather, we were just looking at the fact that there were eight projects, including Amherst Community Connections, but we are asking the town meeting to, re to consider funding all the projects. So I don't believe there's any way or shape that I am in any conflict of interest asking, advocating for just Amherst Community Connections. So I think it's only uh, you know, fair and proper to say that this is a petition for all the agencies, not uh, just for my agency. And I feel really unfortunate that this statement is made in such a way as if indicating uh, there's some ulterior motive on my, my personal part, and I really regret hearing this from a public official in such an insulting way. I regret to hear this. So I'm, I don't mean to speak for Ms. Brewer, but uh, I'm sure she didn't mean to insult you. I think it is uh, those of us who are more familiar with the situation, it's more, trans it's more obvious to us. It's not transparent to everyone. I think it, it is a good suggestion to include that note on your information sheet. So just so folks are clear, Housing for All and Amherst Community Connections are not the same thing, but That's they do correct. share Ms. Greeny in common. So. Um, it, it, it's worth noting, and it's uh, it perhaps is worth we'll noting in a more obvious that. manner. And yeah. I think that Ms. We, Brewer was trying yeah. to. We understand the deadline for the town meeting packet submission deadline. We are intending to submit is April twenty fourth noon time. I think it's the twenty third. Twenty third. It's a Wednesday. Yeah. Anyhow, so we are intending to submit a uh, town meeting information sheet for town meeting's purpose. Good. So at that time, we will make it very clear. So I appreciate your pointing out this part that you would like to you know, see, of course. Great. Yeah, thank you for your uh, input and suggestion. Okay, so uh, so um, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to uh, give town meeting the opportunity to consider, all right, you're either going to distribute these via the CDBG formula or you're going to 
not uh, not needing to be uh, tied to the CDBG formula, there's another option. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to put that choice in front of town meeting, and that's basically what this boils down to. Um, personally, um, I uh, it, it was the it was the select board's intent with the budget policy guidelines to to keep the CDBG process at the social services level as whole as possible for this year. Um, so now our CDBG situation has changed, but um, but my inclination personally is to stick with the town manager's recommendations, which which stay true to the CDBG process, which was what we were trying to keep whole for this year. Um, and I uh, and and I appreciate what you were saying. It's imperfect to without having a, a different process that um, dividing it up evenly is is kind of as good as you can do as an alternative uh, distribution option. Um, I'm concerned not knowing, not having been part of the, the whole process of the recommendations as the committee was um, to divide the money equally that might, way just might not. Be, first of all, it's, um, it's a different kind of percentage of money to each organization, so it changes the value, the worth, if you will, of what they're ending up with uh, in relation to their projects. So I think that, and I appreciate what you're saying about it being imperfect, um, I think it's sort of imperfect enough that it makes it arbitrary and kind of it takes it away from the, uh, what the folks were looking for to fund their projects. So, uh, so, so I, I'm personally going to go with the town manager's recommendation, but um, but I think it's very reasonable for you to give this alternative to town meeting and we'll see what they decide. Um, Mr. Musant, do you have Yeah, just quickly, um, I just want to be clear. Ms. Greening is absolutely correct that whatever local monies, town monies that are voted for these purposes are not subject to the CDBG uh, rules about how many agencies can be funded in one grant round and things like that. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, but the basis of my recommendations, uh, which were informed by the uh, review of all the requests from the, to the CDBG Advisory Committee, uh, they came up with a prioritized list of how they thought the first dollar, second dollar, third dollar should be spent and in what amounts. And so uh, that, that was the basis for my recommendation to come up with a prioritized list at the amounts suggested. Thank you. I'll just note that I received a text message almost an hour ago indicating that our meeting is not on television. I'm not sure, uh, Amherst Media, if, uh, if that is still the case and if it's not too late to fix it. But uh, just so you know, it's not being broadcast, or at least it wasn't as of about 45 minutes ago. All right, moving right along. Um, other questions or comments for the town manager or for Ms. Greeny? Any public comment on this issue? All right. Um, Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? Sure. I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting Article 25 Social Services Funding. For a uh, further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. So, would you like to make a motion on Article 45 also? So, we have a position on that. So this would be not recommend, is that what you're suggesting? Yes, it, because you're either supporting one yeah. or the other. Okay. I move that the select board not recommend to May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 45 petition, equitable distribution of social services funding. Further discussion? All in favor say I, aye. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I think the argument that dividing equally is not always fair. It's a very telling argument with me. There are simply some agencies that need more than others. Ms. Brewer. And following up on that, I think that's one of the things that the town manager looked at when he looked at the Block Grant Advisory Committee's recommendations is he's, you know, it's a question, for example, associated with the homeless shelter. I mean, it needs a big chunk of money or it doesn't function. And so it very much so along with what you're saying, it can be very difficult to just say, well, let's just take a piece off of everybody. Um, I'll leave it at that. I was I was actually going to compliment the clever wording of the title because it's actually sounds really good. Equitable distribution of social services funding. Okay. Are we ready to vote? All in favor say aye. Aye. 
tie. That so is we're voting to not recommend so we're not four zero one. with one right. absent. And so if those get combined um, it, through their, their consideration at town meeting with you make a motion to it or whatever, we can apply our motion appropriately depending how that gets structured. So, okay. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming. Thank you in. very much. Take care. Okay, who would like to speak to the social service articles? Oh, you know I'm going to wrestle you for this. Yeah. Ms. Brewer? Yes, I okay. will. All right. Um, and then we have the town gown one. Right. Mr. Musanti. Yeah, I'm, uh, Article 26 uh, would uh, recommend $30,000 uh, uh, from town's uh, free cash to fund a I'm calling a town gown strategic study. Uh, this request is an outgrowth of ongoing dialogue uh, I've been having with uh, the UMass Chancellor and his team um, and about all kinds of town gown issues, uh, housing, uh, off-campus student behavior, uh, other opportunities for economic development, et cetera. Um, and he suggested uh, in one of our recent discussions uh, the notion of jointly pursuing uh, outside uh, consulting where the town and the university would each contribute 50% uh, of the funds to pursue a study. We would look at things like uh, better aligning or understanding the alignments between the university's master plan and the town's master plan looking at uh, uh, how we can have some new perspectives on economic development opportunities, uh, how they fit in uh, uh, with the university's uh, growth uh, plans, uh, looking at other uh, options to possibly create new housing options, um, and our ongoing work to uh, further improve uh, quality of life, particularly in the surrounding neighborhoods to the main campus and uh, public safety issues generally in the town. So I think it would be a very constructive and helpful substantive uh, path for the town and the university to pursue together uh, to chart a more coherent and more well understood course uh, on, on the part of university uh, community and, and the wider town community. So I think it's a very thoughtful approach, and uh, um, we've asked the chancellor if he would be willing to uh, come and address town meeting on this uh, proposal himself personally, and he has indicated uh, his uh, enthusiasm for doing so. So uh, I second that and uh, uh, would urge the select board to endorse such an article. Thank you. And I'll note that uh, it, it really, when you consider that the university is this massive city basically in the middle of our town, um, the idea that we do not have a, a, a plan for the future together, that we're taking all of these um, very many steps to deal with kind of ongoing short and long-term problems, but, but an actual strategic plan for how does, how does the town's um, vision of the future and the university's vision of the future match up and, and how, do we, how do we kind of work this together, uh, I think is very important. And I think that when he started talking about it, it became very clear that this is a need. Um, my first thought was, okay, well, considering everything, maybe the university ought to be paying for this themselves. But then I thought, um, actually, considering that you want this to be a joint town gown plan you you really need literal buy-in you need the town to be as invested in what this looks like as a what you're looking to be studying and um and what you're looking to to find as outcomes you need to be uh you need to be true partners in that so it doesn't become the university's plan where with the with the town uh, on the side or whatever that it's a true partnership of plan. So, uh, so I urge the select board and town meeting to support it. Ms. Stein, I know this is a really naive question, Don, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What is the money going to be used for exactly? It would be used to engage a consultant uh, who would work with uh, university staff, town staff, uh, and look at uh, the existing plans and and. and uh, develop uh, a more shared vision and some specific action steps to achieve that vision. Uh, 
the, the consultant would in, in many ways act as a facilitator on that dialogue to, to really finish and really clarify the good work that's been done and uh, see if there can be a more coherent and unified path that we can b both articulate to the community going forward. Thank you. Ms. Brewer, I'll get, take public comment in a moment when the select board's done asking questions. As a former longtime member and um, three-year chair of the Comprehensive Planning Committee, I am very happy to do anything we can to bring together our plans and their plans because we are us. We aren't just us and them. I am also incredibly concerned about the amount of resources we have within town to work on yet another study. I know we've been rising to a challenge but struggling with the challenge of dealing with the housing studies that are currently undertaken simply because not because people aren't going 120 miles an hour but simply because there just aren't enough people people might say oh there's a lot of planning staff yeah there's not a lot of planning staff and there's a lot to be kept track of associated with studies and so i'm i'm concerned about i'm, I'm certainly never going to vote against it for that reason I just want to say to the town manager and the town staff, I worry about you. And to let us know if there's a way that we can shift something else, because I do think this is an incredibly important dialogue to take place. I think it's also a substantial amount of money. And so we ought to be able to find a way to make some space for it that's financially viable for us as well, rather than just kind of somehow setting aside X number more hours out of planning staff's time. I am also wanting very much that when this, assuming this would pass, because I'm sure the chancellor, just based on a brief conversation I had with him, is going to do a fabulous job at town meeting explaining this, um, assuming that it passes at town meeting, that there will be some dialogue, prefer, I'm not sure if select board's the right place for it or someplace else, but there needs to be some place where there's some dialogue about what the request for proposals or what it requests for quotes or whichever acronym we're using for this particular product in, might include because it it's definitely important that this is something that is not just we have some planners, they have lots of different kinds of planners. All the planners talk to each other and tell us all one thing in a public meeting. Yeah, no, that's not going to fly. There's going to have to be a way that we know that the consultants are engaging some community groups that are gathered in some fashion, hopefully creatively, by good consultants who know how to facilitate these kind of conversations. Um, so the expectations will be very high. Uh, of this product as opposed to, ah, here's another $15,000 study. This is a big study and this will matter a lot to people and it will be important that people really feel heard. And so it's not a whole new master planning process for either of us because we've just been through that. But I think it's super important that the university is understands that when it comes down to the particulars, we will have a lot of people who want to have input to this other than just show up at a meeting and tell us what you think of our slide presentation. And I know we can do better than that, and I know, but I want to make sure that they don't think that it's as simple as that. Thank you. So I think that, that, sure. that that's the point very clearly is that we need to be equally invested in this so that we get to help shape and define w what we're looking for here. All along, um, exactly. And, and so you're not partners if you're not truly partners. Right. Other questions or comments from select board before I go to the public? All right, Mr. O'Connor, please come forward. Well, I think the, the issues identify that yourself of Vince O'Connor, a precinct one town meeting member, Summer Street. Um, I think there's a, a number of issues that the board, um, the town manager, and maybe the chancellor should be prepared to discuss. Um, th the first is why um, the existing staff who prepared um, and worked with the master plan, even though we did engage consultants, um, we do have a plan, they have a plan, um, so, um, and, they ha and we both have staff people who participated in the, in the preparations of those plans. Um, why it is that our staff people can't do this without outside funding. Um, the 
The second uh, concern that I have is, and that I think is going to have to be addressed at town meeting, is, um, is the question of the university's um, decision to admit more students than they can house and create a problem in the housing market for Amherst families, um, not just low-income families, but families, period, going to be on the table? Because if it's not on the table, I don't know that people are going to vote um, to essentially $30,000 to help implement the university's plan to turn all the rental housing in Amherst into dormitories. Um, and I, I say this because one of the recently become notorious um, landlords uh, who's engaged in a number of uh, rental property and, and just uh, residential property purchases expressed to one of the sellers recently that he was in the, he was buying these um, uh, 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 a rental unit for another party and I think that we should be concerned about who that other party might be um, especially since this this uh, gentleman only rents to students, I, I think that this um, th this could promote a discussion unless people are prepared to address the issues that are uh, quite underneath, you know, not too far underneath the surface. This could provide a discussion that rather than being a a wonderful opportunity to have the town and the university. Um, do something together. It might provide a very embarrassing moment for the chancellor and for the town. And I, I just think that the select board ought to really consider if you're not prepared to answer the tough questions that are going to come up about this, whether in fact this article um, might not, uh, the study might not be done just by staff, people who were thoroughly involved on both, with both entities in the master plans and this article be dismissed. I, I think this is uh, this more than any other article on the town meeting floor. This will give people an opportunity to say things that, um, unless unless we're prepared to have a very frank, in the words of diplomacy, a very frank discussion in a situation where frankness is not a usual thing. Um, I, I think this article. Um, has the potential to create a, a real embarrassing situation for all parties. Thank you very much. Um, I think obviously housing will be a very big consideration in the study. And I mean, it's, it's about the impacts of, uh, of the university on the town and how we grow and, and adapt together. So I think that all the points that you just made point to the need for the study. Um, but it certainly will be a, an interesting discussion in town meeting. And it'll be, a, it'll be an interesting question for the town. Uh, do we want to plan together or do we want to simply have um, the, the outcomes of lack of planning on these issues together. So um, so the, the town will decide and uh, we'll see. Um, Ms. Keller. And please identify yourself. Janet Keller, Precinct One, um, town meeting member. Um, I would like to concur that how the RFP is drawn is incredibly important and also agree that it's very important that um, our townspeople, business people, residents, all who are affected um, are not only heard, but included in a high quality collaboration here. And I realize um, I'm setting the bar very high when I say that. And yet, I think it's so important. I think we've, um, I'm hoping that we're seeing that as we do more of that, um, we, we're pleased with the results that we're getting. We're seeing that people are working more together. And when the, when the geese are pointing this way, they get to the south a lot faster and easier, um, if you will. 
So um, I hope that that will be the case. One thing I'd like to say is that a lot of people have been working awfully hard over the time, I guess it was February 2009, when the master plan was approved by the planning board, and have learned a number of things, and if there would be an opportunity to, if you will, um, bring things a little bit up to state, say that was then and this is where we were, and I'm not talking about pulling the plan apart, I'm talking about in those four years, what did we learn that's key to um, doing, um, making new collaborative plans with the university and the town and its people, um, one that uh, more closely addresses our new understandings. And I think there are a number of those. I'm not going to take your time with them now, but um, I, I think those are the, I, I would also like to address, and I know people uh, perennially have a concern about plans and and my <clears throat> my own experience uh, in some of the projects that I worked on when I was working um, for the state of Rhode Island is is sometimes there was capacity in-house although as the uh, years went on and the squeeze got tighter <laughs> um, that was less and less the case but sometimes we just simply did not have that set of skills or that in-depth um, experience with that set of data, if you will, or to um, do the kind of study that I think you're going to want to have. So I'd like to put in my plug for the value that can come when you bring in top-notch outside folks. So. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in. Okay, other questions and comments then about this article? Ms. Brewer. I think it, it is perfectly appropriate for when the chancellor speaks for him to make clear that, you know, we're not just, we the university are not just gonna say, you're getting 3,000 more students, deal with it. We don't need to spend $60,000 to find that out. And so I don't think he has any intention of saying that because what would be the point of having this study then? This study is not to gloss over any of their reality. Their reality is they feel like they need more students because they need more out-of-state tuition to make the place function better financially. Um, and so the, the intent here, I, I, I'm very frustrated by the idea that, well, because there's going to be more demand on Amherst housing, why have the study? Well, if we don't have the study, we see what we get. I mean, we have two plans now. We actually worked fairly closely together as we developed our master plans, and yet we haven't really gotten to a point, despite all the work of the Campus Community Coalition and a bunch of different areas, we just can't all quite seem to get to a place where we really are feeling comfortable. And maybe there's gonna, maybe there never will be that for some people, and maybe that's just the reality. But more people could maybe feel part of things. And so I, I have hope for the study as being something that could serve that rather than just it is what it is. You guys are just going to have to figure out your rental regulations and your police presence, and we'll give you some couple of ambulances, and it's done. I think by them saying this, they're making it clear that that's not what they want to do, that they want to be more forward thinking, that they want to think about what's everybody else doing beyond what we've already learned from the different research that people are already doing in best practices, and that it really is trying to move us forward, not just another study that states the obvious, because we already have that information. Right, and, and so there's gonna be a real physical component to it. You yeah. know, it, what, what, what do the edges of the university look like in relation to the edges of the community? Is, should, there be, should there be more buffer between them? Is there right. a way to make this all more um, more positive and more more melding or not melding, you know, what what's, would the word be? Differentiating or something between them. Um, but let, let's look at let's look at the 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 physical parts of what the what the university means to Amherst as well as the on the ground impacts. I mean, it's we're all too aware of the issues. So this is a um, this is a very uh, targeted uh, a professional way of trying to look at those and, and define what we're looking for for outcomes. So 
Any other comments about the article? Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board recommend to the May 6, 2013 annual town meeting, Article 26, Town Gown Strategic Planning. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, we're done with. Well, we need somebody to speak to. Oh, it. I'm sorry. Um, I'd be happy to speak to that. I was going to say, we're all looking at you. <laughs> That's what I was we thinking. We try not to pressure you for these things, but that I'm one makes copy sense. Your, um, people I lost track okay. of for a while. All right, so now we're done with more articles for right now. Um, so next week we'll have a whole bunch more, and the week after that, and the week after that. It's just warrant articles all the way up until town meeting now. Um, the next item is food truck and lunch cart regulations. And this is something that um, I've given you a couple of updates on previously. We have, uh, I had presented what were the results of um, some meetings between uh, the chamber director, the bid director, and myself talking about the different issues involved in uh, food truck regulations and how we might kind of get a hold of this situation before it grows. This is a this is a sector. I don't know if anyone saw the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine this week, but uh, it was a whole thing devoted to food trucks. It's a real burgeoning thing around the country. Who knows if it will continue to burgeon in Amherst, but we didn't want to be inundated with applications and issues and concerns before we had some kind of a structure uh, in which to think about those. So, um, so a couple of months ago, we put out the details of that, of, of what the regs would, would address to the select board, to the licensees, to the public, looking for comment. Um, we got some comment. We got good response from staff. And what we have here is, um, is the beginnings of regulations, or not the beginnings of, uh, regulations to start with right now and then to amend as necessary as we see how the regulations work and how the sector uh, potentially develops in Amherst. So I have a cover memo that uh, outlines a couple of key points for you as well as the regulations themselves. Uh, let me just look at the cover memo, see if I'm missing any key points. Um, I note, oh, one thing is that uh, the regulations use the term lunch cart throughout, and that is to keep them consistent with the mass general law that calls them lunch carts. Um, so we call them food trucks, but that's just sort of their popular name of the moment. It is a lunch, tr a lunch cart license that, um, that the um, town issues, thanks to state regulation, allowing us to do that. The, um, the license fee is capped at $100. We cannot increase that fee without state legislative help if we wanted to do that. Um, I noted the part at the bottom about parking. We have had a request from one of the food truck vendors to consider meter bags for them. Um, the regulations, as you know, recommend not limiting the time uh, at meters for the food trucks. and. Uh, so I talked to the parking folks about that. They were very good with exempting them from the meter time regulations, but said that the meter bags would actually be a real problem. Uh, and I was actually going by a meter today that had a crinkled up bag on it, just some random <laughs> meter with a truck. <laughs> I'm going, we didn't approve, we didn't buy this bag. So I can see how just having a bunch of meter bags out there is maybe not the best thing. So, um, so I did note that, uh, if that proved to be a real problem, it's possible a request would come to us in the future. Or we might we might ourselves initiate an idea of some kind of a permit for um, for food trucks parking. So, um, but that that's just a that's just a maybe out there in the future. I have no idea if that's a good idea or not. We would need to vet that. But um, just indicating that there is the potential to um, to continue to find ways to address this if we find that challenges continue. Uh, town council did review these and approved them, had no legal issues with them and approved them as to form. And um, the only thing that is changed from when you saw the draft of the details was we took out uh, one parking area that we had indicated as, as potential possibilities were the driveways uh, at Kendrick Park, the, the, the old driveways, right. um, and two things. One is um, DPW director indicated a concern about those that it would actually uh, had the potential to block some travel lanes either on the sidewalk or, or the bike path. Um, 
And also it occurred to me that um, the Ken Kendrick Park isn't actually under our jurisdiction. That's the town manager's property to control. So um, that could be a separate consideration. Basically, these are public way considerations for where the uh, food trucks could go. So questions or comments from the select board about the regulations? Ms. Stein. Um, I just, one place that we often see them parked is opposite the Bank of America. Is that precluded by these? I couldn't quite Yes, this would move them down. It would. Yep, yeah, they right. would need to be south of Spring Street. Okay. So that's on the main common as opposed to the north common. All right, and they are not unhappy about that shift in location or have they commented on that? Um, uh, Miss Valley, who is the proprietor of that food truck, um, has not indicated a concern okay. about that. Um, and the other thing that I found amusing was Section 8. Um, they couldn't play music of any kind, which is all right with me, but I was thinking that ice cream carts routinely do. Um, that's, that's almost sort of their signature. So I was wondering if there had been any comment about that or if state law um, gives them permission. Ice cream trucks are actually regulated differently under that's state law, so I kind of left them alone, and that's why I put in the, in the definition part, except as otherwise defined as an ice cream truck. Okay. There, there's all kinds of weird stuff that goes okay. with them, and I did not become an expert in ice cream truck licensing while okay. I did this, so I can't explain Extra. to you what these are. I was right. just, it just <laughs> occurred to me that. Yeah, uh, I actually added that on spec as I was working on this because um, we had some noise issues, as you know, with one of the, um, one of the cards. That was a generator issue. But the sounds that come from these are something to consider, and um, the, uh, there is actually some kind of a, a rule, or maybe it has to do with ZBA permits, that um, for restaurants and other places downtown, they need to get permission if they're going to be amplifying music okay. outside. So uh, to have a truck pull up and suddenly start creating a bunch of music when we already ha heard a lot of concern from folks that these places don't need to go through the same kind of strict permitting and DRB and all of that. So to allow them to potentially be very noisy, noisy with music or whatever just seemed like something you wanted to nip in the bud at the beginning. But if people don't agree with that. I'm, I'm oh, I just I'm. was curious. <laughs> Other questions or comments, Ms. Brewer? What do my notes say from the last time, Ms. O'Keefe? Because I don't remember and I don't have them in front of me. So One of the just things that you had asked about was um, that we had the question <laughs> of bathrooms. I knew you could. <laughs> I did remember that. bathrooms yeah. for the health department. So... Um, because we had one um, brick and mortar person uh, right. saying that, uh, indicating that he thought that the uh, a food truck person was using their bathroom without permission. And so there's, I said, well, I know that they've got to submit some kind of list of bathrooms. So something. I checked with the health right. director and the health director said that they do require a list of bathrooms with hand sinks that are available to them on their route, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, it does not specify that permission is required. So it might just be, they might they might deal with that on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Maybe some people get permission from them, and some people just indicate where these bathrooms with hand sinks are. Um, because that is a health issue, I have no idea if we would have the ability to tweak that. So if that continues to be, if that is not continues to be, if that is indicated as a concern of the select board, whether they have permission or not, then perhaps Ms. Stein could um, take that up with Board of Health, just let them know that we have a concern about it. It may, um, th so much of what happens with Board of Health uh, is r relying on the state sanitary code that we may or may not be able to make any tweaks to that, but if that is a concern of ours, then perhaps they could look into whether that is tweakable. That was the one that stood out to me of uh, your concerns. You, what you also talked about enforcement, um, general enforcement with parking. By taking away the requirement on timing, by, lim by not limiting mm -hmm. them to two hours at the meters, um, that is, staff believes that that's easy now for them to, to deal with because that, that was the main consideration. Is like, who knows when they arrived and when they're going to leave. And, and we had public comment also saying, you know, come on, two hours is just not reasonable to them. Have these people necessarily right. set up, et cetera? Um, so, uh, so be, 
considering the places that we agreed for them to park, uh, agreed, meaning uh, Mr. Maroulis, Mr. Crograbe, and I, as places that, um, to refresh your memory, are places that we thought would help to try and restore or bring or restore vitality to certain areas that are kind of quiet, um, which also makes them puts them in areas that are of less concern often to um, the business folks. So it was kind of striking, striking the right balance of all the things that we were looking for. Um, and I was just talking about that why. Oh, so that puts them in parking places that are um, less, of, uh, less of a concern for the turnover. I mean, certainly all spaces downtown are precious, and we recognize that. But, but the more kind of at the limits you put them, the less pressure is on those spaces. And so the enforcement they thought would work well. Yes. Wow, you remembered two of the things I already sat here and thinking about. So they must have been the two most important things. Actually, the third thing that I'm pretty sure isn't on here that I'm not seeing is when there's a problem. So for example, hours of operation, we approve X hours. Somebody notices, man, these people are always here three hours before, like wicked early in the morning. Are they really allowed to do that? Well, they could call the office upstairs and say, what hours are these people allowed to operate? And they could find out. But beyond that, what's the complaint process? I think we should have a way that we tell people in this reg, if some or somehow, I remember having this conversation about taxis oh many years before we had taxi regulations and I said when somebody has a problem with a taxi call 1-800 what you know what are they supposed to do we never we didn't do anything with that until we got to the point of writing the regs um, so now and it became very clear that we could leave a bunch of that to the police because that you know they're inspecting vehicles it, it kind of all comes part and parcel together for the police to deal with the taxi um, you know, if, if, we, if somebody said, I don't think so-and-so washed their lettuce, you know, obviously the Board of Health is who would, not the Board of Health, but the Public Health Director would get involved. But if they're just, who are, who are people supposed to complain to when they have an issue? Do we, should, are we assuming that it will just be the select board office and they will parse it out? Or you know, what are we attempting to do with this? Um suggestions are welcome <laughs> I mean I, I think I, I don't think that's an unreasonable approach I think that would be an easy way to start rather than having a checklist of 15 different possibilities call about this call this person call that person um, because we have an incredibly capable although changing staff upstairs um, I'm presuming that they would be okay with that that they would figure out because they're not they're not the kind of staff some other town might have that would say oh I don't know um, they would figure it out. And if they started to see a series of complaints, then obviously they could bring that back to the town manager and he could bring yeah, it to I us. Think the, yeah, the, I mean, the, 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 the real answer is it, it would depend. Right. So as the staff to the licensing board, you know, my office might receive such a complaint and depending upon the nature of the complaint, would refer it, you know, could be to parking, could be health, could be inspection services, could be police for that matter, uh, could be inspection services. Um, so the answer would be it would depend. So I guess I'd just like to see when we publish this then, um, we'll put it up on the website, obviously, on the select board section. Um, there is a, uh, there's a regulation, for the regulations yeah, section. And, regulations. and then we could put next to it, or you know, like when you go to this page somewhere, it would say, you know, concerns, complaints, whatever, call the select board uh, the mm -hmm. town manager slash town manager office and until they get start getting inundated and we have to figure out some other way of doing it. Just so people know, okay, well that's all well and good, but what do I what do I do after that? So I think that's so like a good solution. So I could add a new section is uh, do you want that in the regulations? Just or make it it's almost day. like a title. Yeah. You know, or, or like a a parenthesis next to it or whatever I'm I mean it seems to me you might want to say you know in the event of non-compliance call and then so these are for non-compliance these are regulations for the food truck so I'm not sure they're that not people gonna, would look at right. them but I could just I could indicate that um, I, I think I can do what you're saying so you, you so could the, say I guess from the standpoint of the vendor because we'll pass these out to the vendor right so we're because it, it serves a couple of different purposes they go to the vendor themselves, but then they also are on the town website so that people who are uptight about something can go and look at it and see what it says. So you could add a sentence that said, you know, 
concerns or whatever will be you know sent to the town manager's office for whatever um, review and and parsing out or obviously that's not the great terminology but something along those lines so that they know too that you know they they might well be hearing from the town manager's office if there's questions about what they're doing right so so um, concerns or complaints received by the select board office because it could be received by by consumers they could be received by board of health or the police chief or somebody saying you know what you've got various issues with these with you know food truck x um will be will like be that's the coordination point distribute. yeah so okay so i can add that so yeah I, I would recommend that that would be a new uh a section either 11 or 12 either before or after the penalties for non-compliance okay. yeah, which, whichever I thinking. Thinking. sounds good I'm going to call it 10 and a half. A. No, 10 and a half. Come on. That's what MGL does. She can do that. That's right. <laughs> Why not? Okay. All right. Other, uh, other issues? Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Okay. All right. Public comment, Mr. O'Connor. Again, Vincent O'Connor, uh, Precinct 1, Town Meeting Member, Summer Street. Um, one of the lunch truck um, uh, proprietors is a constituent of uh, in Precinct 1. She did call me. Um, she has a, a child in Wildwood School. I think she's, uh, the lunch truck has journeyed to Wildwood School on occasion um, and, uh, and also to Amherst College. So, um, and I just finished reading the regulations. They seem relatively simple and straightforward. Um, I'd, I'd express two concerns. I would hope that the prohibition against amplified music, which would be external to the truck, would not be interpreted to prohibit the proprietor from having a radio inside the truck that they could um, they could use to you know uh, while they were preparing food and serving food and so forth. So if that if that were understood, something that wouldn't broadcast externally. But but it would be somewhat difficult, probably, for people who are used to working to some music, to not be able to have music inside there. Um, so the, it it says lunch carts may not play music or use any kind of sound amplification to attract customers. Okay. So, so it's the, to attract that, customers. If right. you're just if so you're listening no, to the ball game external. quietly as you're making something. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So okay. I, I think that the I think that the. So the the other uh, thing I'd say is that I. I guess I'm concerned about the limitations on where the the, the on-street vehicles could park. Um, I think that the the sidewalk vehicles have a, a pretty generous uh, series of locations, um, and I I think what I'd say is I um, some I think some people. I mean I'm, I've actually seen this constituent in operation a couple of times. And I think that she has this very, like, energetic quality that, that, you know, that adds something to the downtown. And rather than seeing um, downtown customers like a like our our budget, a zero sum game that if somebody gets some part of the budget, somebody else doesn't get get it. Um, I think that there is uh, some flexibility to. Uh, to what happens downtown. And I think having uh, businesses like these uh, lunch, the on the sidewalk carts and the lunch trucks that are in the public way are, um, they would actually bring people into the downtown. I mean, it might increase, make the pie larger. And I would, I would think that if we view it this way, then I think maybe we could look at ways to attracting, using the presence of, of these activities to bring people to the downtown. The other thing is um, uh, my constituent pointed out that she, she doesn't just operate in Amherst. She goes over. And I think having a positive experience in Amherst um, with somebody who, who, who travels throughout the region um, would make her an, a sort of a goodwill ambassador for the town. And I think that uh, I'd, I think that she would make a great ambassador for the town given what she does and the kind of energetic way she interacts with people. 
and I would hope that the town would view her and other lunch truck, truck operators in that manner. Um, that, that if we uh, are accommodating and respectful and understand that they may actually do something positive for the downtown, increase the size of the pie. So that, um, and I also think that when we're, um, when we're in the process of maybe negotiating with the university about the restrictions that they've placed on some of our businesses in the downtown, that we wouldn't want to have an example that we're sort of doing the same thing on a slightly different level. So I, I would urge you to be, um, uh, in the words of um, a town meeting member from Precinct 10 who, who in the first debate on uh, um, about, about the resident alien voted, voting, he said, uh, when in doubt, be generous. Thank you very much. And I think that's very much the spirit that we tried to well, work on these in. This is, uh, this is trying to acknowledge the, uh, all the pluses that these, uh, these businesses bring to the downtown, the, uh, the, the vibrancy, the sense of, you know, I wonder who's there now. And, and it, it's kind of, it creates a, a, a true dynamic because it's a changing situation. Um, they have proven to be very popular with uh, the public and we got a lot of good feedback uh, early on directly and, and through the newspaper and whatever from the public about them so we wanted to make sure that they are accommodated as positively as possible um, and uh, and that that we are taking a welcoming approach to this um, again as I indicated we want to make sure we had some regulations before we end up having you know 50 you know applications for these or whatever so we have a framework in which to think about these uh, as I indicated in the cover memo um, having gone through this whole kind of thought exercise of doing this, um, it made me realize how, well, first of all, we were working essentially without regulation before, but um, when the thing comes before us, there are actually kind of cons uh, certain questions that we should be considering and asking in relation to um, what's most appropriate for what spot, because these things are, they vary a lot, um, particularly the sidewalk ones. They, you know, it could be, it could be, you know, just like a little push cart thing that you've got with hot dogs, or it could be the big freestanding halal thing um, that's out there. Um, so uh, one set, it's, the, the regulations have to sort of accommodate the whole spectrum, but a, uh, a checklist for the select board to consider, um, I, I indicated if we can't kind of fit everything onto the new improved license application, um, a checklist would be a good way to for the select board to say okay oh yeah and you're exactly what size and you know do you have you know whatever kind of a footprint and um but just to be more specific about our considerations because before we were just like okay food truck yeah we don't know what to do with that so um this is the beginning it's not the end i'm sure that we will tweak these uh further as uh the situation shows us but i think it feels like a good starting point miss brewer and then miss stein I think actually Mr. Oh, Waldo's hand up before okay. I did. Uh, oh, I think yeah. you've covered much of what I want to say, so that's. Okay. Oh, good. Now I can be boring again. Um, quickly, I really appreciate what you said about the checklist, and you're even volunteering to draft it as well based on all your knowledge. Because one of the things that comes back to me as being a potential point of contention, although not yet, just something to keep ourselves aware of, is the hours of operation situation. Because of the types of permits that brick and mortar places have to have in order to be open certain late night hours we would not want to just cavalierly perhaps say oh sure whatever hours you want even though to a large degree we want to be able to say whatever hours you want so we might want to just keep ourselves apprised of of how we're doing of how that's turning out mm -hmm. so that because we may need to revisit it but at this point my my assumption is not to say okay well do all the abutters have permits to do x y and z i don't want to make it that complicated but just looking under section six hours of operation i'm one you know it it's not that we're going to write anything different in there at this point i think it's that we need to put on the checklist kind of you know if if this was a restaurant or, you know, the police chief has, he has a sense of overall, you know, this is what these kinds of places are open these hours. I just don't want people to get into conflict over something that's inadvertent on our part associated with that and what just seems like a real good idea to a new hot, hot, hot dog operator, but um, something along those lines to be aware of. Okay. 
Ms. Stein. Um, I have two comments, one more expansive, one more restrictive. Um, I think that you might consider actually limiting the number um, in some way, just as we do with alcohol licenses. Uh, no, section 10 has a limitation. Oh, did I, in fact, miss it? We went right past it. It didn't have a little number in Sorry. parentheses. That's Sorry. why we okay, didn't Okay, good. I'm glad. I do think that perhaps um, section 3A1 is a little bit restrictive. Um, it's, it's really, I would have liked that to be a little bit more expansive than, than um, just the west side of town common south of Spring Street, for example, on the main drag. Um, certainly it was more used on the main drag than, than that prior to these. So I, I do find that a little bit tight. I just, um, you know, it used to be that opposite the Bank of America, there were two parked side by side. I mean, I've seen that often, two of the food um, trucks parked side by side. So all of a sudden, neither of them could be there. And I don't think they're really competing with the Bank of America in terms of, you know, food service. Um, okay, Subway is across the street, but I, I just... So it's, there's no parking directly across from Bank of America that, at the entrance to the town hall parking lot. Right. Parking spaces are further back than that. Okay, but that general area. You know what yeah, I mean. uh, parking on the North Common versus the Main Common, yeah, basically. Yeah, I meant the North Common. Yeah. So, um, so that I, that's the only thing that I've, I mean, the rest of it is... is Fine. So I just wonder if you should add a couple more to that section. That's my personal opinion. Okay. So uh, we could do this a couple of ways. One is we could start with this and see how it goes and add to it as um, necessary. Um, we could change it now, um, and we certainly could do that. My only concern with that is that people wouldn't have been able to react to what, that as a proposal, so there wouldn't have been any opportunity for comment on that. Whereas we've had the, these out there with the comment potential for um, however long. Um, but if the select board felt strongly that that was a, a, a critical problem with them, then we could make the change. And I don't know if people would complain or not, but I guess I'm, I guess I'm, I've talked myself into being inclined to, um, to not make a change that people didn't have the opportunity to comment on. But I, I, I completely agree that we need to be paying attention to where these places, where the locations are and how that's working out. I mean, if the, if the truck vendors say to us, there's nobody down there, you know, part of what we're trying that's to do is make thing. the common mm -hmm. be more used. Like, what a wonderful place to sit out and have your lunch. But it's actually kind of a hike from any place that you would get your lunch. So, but maybe if there's a food truck there, then now people will start having lunch on the common. Um, but if, if the food truck folks don't find that to be the case and they say we're in no man's land then we say okay that's not working let's let's tweak it uh, maybe um when these get posted we could say let's try these for six months and six months, okay. have a uh, feedback at the end of that time by okay. by both the vendors and non-vendors um, to see how it's working okay. so these basically go into effect once we approve them um, so yeah. we'll approve them, if, assuming we're going to approve them tonight as amended with the change that we talked about, about complaints, et cetera. And, uh, and we can schedule a um, feedback and, and reconsideration, just like a check-in to them. What, six months? We're in, we're in April now. That's the fourth month, so the 10th month is October. So that gives us spring, summer, and summer. fall. That's yeah. a nice, That'd that's a good, good chunk of, um, okay. of consideration. Okay. So okay. how about I move? Um, that the select board approve the rules regulating the use and operation of lunch carts as presented with um, a notice of a reexamination of these in six months' time. So we should say as revised as because amended, we talked about yeah. the complaints and concerns section as well. Ah, you did. Okay. So as revised. <laughs> yep. Good. Is there a second? Second. Oh, I'm sorry for the discussion, Ms. Keller. 
Uh, if you come to the mic, you can ask anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> You've got an item on here, um, schedule of police response costs. We haven't gotten there yet. I, and I know you haven't gotten oh. there. <laughs> so um, are you going to get to that? And is there a rough idea about when you might get to that? Midnight. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a really long night. We're doing the best we can. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so I just better plan accordingly. Right, so the the document is online, um, so it has information on there, so I'm not sure if you're looking to just learn what the information is or um, comment on it. You mean the... Um, schedule the, of response costs. Oh, that is... The I dollars. That. Yeah. We have, you have the memo, yeah. yes. That's okay. <laughs> no problem. That was a very practical answer to my practical Good. question. Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, so we will, we will be getting to that topic. We will be talking about the document that is on the web packet. I'm terribly sorry you had to sit around here unnecessarily. That's fine, thanks. But we like having company, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Okay, so back to food truck regulation. So we do actually finish this up. Um, so we did, uh, that we was looking for the discussion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you very much. And you know that checklist on my next yep, week, right? Six months. I got that. Six months. Yep. I I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and I said, you have that checklist on my next week. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> I don't think we so, need it I mean, desperately at all. It's just I'll part it of the package. We, right. For when we have another, another application, one. I'll be sure to That's have right. it. That's right. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Moving right along. FY14 budget discussion. Mr. Musanti. Um, yeah. The uh, a couple things. Uh, Aaron had submitted a list of questions that I, I just this afternoon sent out an email reply to those, so chew on that, but um, there was a second batch of questions that he submitted that we should have over the next day or, day or two for you. I did want to um, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the state uh, situation and uh, the ongoing, well, the debate has begun in earnest on the actual legislation that was recommended uh, by the House and Senate leadership and their Ways and Means chairs and transportation chairs. That debate has begun uh, in full swing, as they say, in the House uh, this afternoon um, on a uh, really a smaller version of the governor's proposal, uh, looking at a total of $500 million per year related to transportation infrastructure and regional transit. Uh, the governor proposed roughly a billion dollars a year related to transportation. Uh, and so the legislature has begun that debate. Um, what we did learn at Senator Rosenberg's uh, uh, municipal conference in Northampton on Saturday where a number of cabinet officials were there and a lot of the uh, state leadership, uh, Mass DOT Secretary Davey was there, uh, the Senate Transportation Chair, uh, Senator McGee, uh, uh, Administration and Finance Secretary Glenn Shore spoke to the group. Uh, it was a very good workshop. Uh, there was a clear indication from uh, Senator Rosenberg and Senator McGee that local road funding uh, is a priority uh, uh, of the legislature uh, going forward. And I think that bodes well for at least the first year trying to get to a $300 million a year figure on Chapter 90 road money. Uh, that's a 50% increase, and that would be worth over 400,000 in, in additional dollars to the town of Amherst for road work uh, if that was to uh, be included in the package. Uh, and ideally, uh, over a five-year period, they're talking more of a five-year period, but it, the debate is about the adequacy <coughs> of the 500 million to fund all of the various things, in, uh, including regional transit and some of the other bigger state projects that need to be funded, uh, including some 91 work through downtown Springfield and <coughs> projects all over, all over the region. Um, so we're expecting to get movement on that uh, 
over the next several days, and it's kind of high stakes poker down there at the moment. Thank you. Um, questions or comments about state situation, how that impacts our plans, Ms. Brewer? Um, wow, it's really late. <laughs> it just feels really late. Um, and it's not, you know, it's only 9.15, but we've been busy. When we were advocating for the governor's plan, we were advocating for both the transportation and the education side of things. Um, interestingly, as you know, because you were there, but as public may or may not be hearing this, um, that at Stan's wonderful municipal conference, he didn't have an education section like he often does, but we did get to hear Secretary Matt Malone, so that was terrific. But um, education does not seem to be getting a lot of play in terms of funding. And so there are, in fact, people who are actively working against the transportation plan that's being proposed because it doesn't have the education piece in it, so as a strategy to approach the education side of things. So I would just ask that the town manager keep us apprised as a select board how we can work with our select school committee counterparts, et cetera, because you know, when we came forward back in early days, we said, great, both, both parallel tracks, that's terrific. Um, I just don't want us to be working at cross purposes, or at least certainly not without being aware of it. So that would be helpful. Thank you. Ms. Fine. Um, I just want to say that one of the things that was appealing about the governor's plan originally was that it was a chance to make the tax system a little bit more progressive, a little less regressive. And unfortunately, what the legislature is coming up with is more regressive because it's adding three cents to the gasoline tax, which in principle, I think is a good idea, but it is not a progressive taxation. I think it's a good idea because we would like people to drive less. Um, but I don't think that's the way I would have preferred to have our um, revenues enhanced. So, um, and we did have um, the education secretary speak, and I thought he was remarkable in many ways, um, not the least, uh, or one of the things that was particularly appealing to me was his passion for poor children and wanting to make sure there would be enough money as the governor proposed so that pre-kindergarten classes, which are clearly an advantage for underprivileged children, um, would give them a chance so that by third grade they would be capable readers and so on. And then he, he voiced his support for the educational system all the way through, including higher education. And I thought he was very amusing to confess to us that he was a registered Republican. It seemed as if the things he was advocating for were really not what I expected from a registered Republican when it comes to education. So it was a, a very nice opportunity to meet him. And I just, uh, I hope he gets to fund some of the very good initiatives he talked about and that all the money doesn't go to transportation. Thank you. Other questions or comments about the state budget, how it affects our local proposal? Anything else you'd like to add, Mr. Misanti, about the situation? Uh, no, but we'll be seeing a House Ways and Means budget proposal on April 10th, uh, later this week. Okay. Action by the full House by the end of April. April 10th, Ways and Means. Okay, thank you. All right, next up we have Town Manager's <coughs> report. Uh, several things to punch through. Uh, notes. Uh, first, an update on traffic calming recommendations. You know, at uh, your, one of your recent meetings, we talked about parking uh, uh, and paving plans for the calendar 13, and we had some really uh, uh, helpful testimony at, at your meeting from uh, residents of uh, Blue Hills Road and Dana Street, uh, among others. Um, and we had recommendations uh, urging us not to proceed with uh, installing uh,
traffic calming speed humps on one street but not the other because of the worry that that would uh, create the unintended consequences of, of uh, increasing through traffic on the the other street and possibly create that make that a less safe street which is the opposite of the intention for all this um, that was very persuasive to me I followed up with uh, staff and with uh, uh, those residents I have uh, uh, instructed our DPW that in calendar 13 uh, we proceed with the installation of speed humps on both Dana Street and Blue Hills uh, Road uh, the Dana Street ones would be the permanent asphalt speed humps which were always planned uh, on top of the newly paved street uh, but on Blue Hills which isn't likely to be paved uh, resurfaced for several more years I've, asked, I've instructed DPW to install asphalt speed humps uh, that would be put in at you know during the same period as those on Dana so that those improvements on traffic coming happen uh, uh, at the same time um, so I think that'll be a very positive thing. Uh, uh, on Lincoln Avenue, which is undergoing sewer repair work at the, at the moment, uh, and which is a precursor to the installment of a base coat, and then uh, after that, uh, a top finish coat, I've also instructed uh, DPW to install asphalt speed humps on Lincoln Avenue this year so that we don't have a period go by uh, where there are no speed humps uh, which has long been the plan for when that road work gets done what isn't settled yet is whether those speed humps will be temporary asphalt speed humps or the permanent asphalt speed humps and that very much depends on uh, some additional uh, uh, evaluation that needs to occur about whether it will be possible to um, install the top coat of asphalt this calendar year on Lincoln or if we have to wait until the spring of 2014 for to ensure all the appropriate settling of the base coat occurs so that when the top coat will last as long as it should last um, so I don't know the answer to that but at, at minimum there'll be temporary speed humps on Lincoln best case is there'll be permanent speed humps on Lincoln this year but the important thing is that uh, speed humps are happening on Lincoln this year Great, thank you that's very good news questions or comments about that Thank That's good. Okay. Uh, next uh, uh, update, uh, we are in the midst of uh, interviewing. I have not interviewed uh, finalist candidates yet, but that's uh, imminent uh, to fill the uh, administrative assistant position in my office uh, that was, uh, was held by Debbie Gordon, who I have transferred to the fire department uh, beginning this week. Um, I included in your packet uh, uh, copies of the job description of both the assistant to the town manager, which is Deborah Roussel's position, uh, and uh, the administrative assistant. And it just gives you a more detailed flavor of all the various work that the office staff do, which is invaluable to me, but in, I know invaluable to the select board. And the we're interacting also with all the various town staff and departments, uh, lots of involvement on constituent work, uh, primary support uh, on the select board's work, uh, particularly on licensing and uh, committee appointments, keeping all those uh, applications and databases up to date, dealing with applicants for the various licenses, uh, all kinds of work on meeting prep for these meetings, uh, uh, um, you know, town meeting preparation, day-to-day uh, -day support for the human resources function, uh, also in my office, and uh, finance director work, uh, and all my work uh, that gets done every day. So, uh, just wanted to put that in there and give you that flavor. Uh, fundamentally important uh, work being done now by two full-time positions uh, back in the day uh, five six years ago there were three positions devoted to this effort and you know uh, my office was one of the cuts that offices that shared in the cuts we had to make across town government when we downsized the staffing levels by about 10 percent so um, they're doing good work and uh, 
hope to be able to uh, announce a very capable new hire uh, ASAP. Questions or comments about that? Thank you. Okay, great. Next, uh, uh, I have a memo in your packet uh, related to uh, putting the uh, details together and out there and into action uh, beginning uh, this spring. Uh, we've developed, I've worked with Police Chief Livingstone on developing a schedule of police response costs that could be imposed upon You know, nuisance house violations, landlords. Uh, when we when we reach what's considered an excessive number of of such violations uh, in a period of time, which is three, uh, working with the chief, uh, we developed what we think is a reasonable and appropriate schedule of response costs for police response. Uh, we came up with an hourly rate for patrol officers uh, with a one-hour minimum. Uh, 25 bucks an hour, supervisors at a slightly higher rate, $29 an hour, and then uh, costs related to vehicle wear and tear of about $20 per hour. And all of those costs are, are uh, consistent with other calculations we've done with grants and other things. And so we thought it was quite reasonable. Um, and uh, the mechanism would be working with the call data about how many officers and vehicles, et cetera, responded. Uh, so this will be a guideline uh, that the chief will use and wanted to have that out publicly. That was a, a good constructive uh, uh, criticism uh, that was uh, uh, offered uh, you know, last fall when we were considering amendments to the nuisance house bylaw that the existing bylaw called for uh, the imposition of these police response costs on um, violations of more than three times and we hadn't put that into practice uh, over the past couple of years since the nuisance house bylaw was adopted. So this, this puts some meat to the bones on this, I think, and uh, allows us to proceed. So does the select board think that we need any action related to this? Um, the, the, this was created by, uh, as Ms. Mercedes said, the, the town manager and the police chief working together determining actual costs. Um, I think that we can just accept them as the, the current costs. I think that if we were to sort of vote to approve them or whatever, then they're kind of enshrined, whereas um, I think that like all costs, it should be you know potentially dynamic responding to what the costs are of the moment or whatever going forward. So if we vote on them, then they need to change, whereas the idea of a schedule that is um, that is established and maintained by the town manager and the police chief to meet the needs, I think makes the most sense. So, Ms. Brewer? Absolutely, and, and then of course the next step being that were we to ever get to the point of having to assess these costs, that then we would get reports that would tell us, yes, we had to assess the costs, but this is just one of the steps in the process from the bylaw to say, yep, we did this part, check. <laughs> We've moved on to the next thing. Yep. And, uh, and I, I agree with Ms. Musanti's point about, you know, that, that we hadn't done this yet, it hadn't been done yet. Um, and when we talk about the, uh, the tools that we bring to these issues, we don't have all that many tools really that we can use. So here's one that town meeting gave us and we hadn't been using yet. So I think it, it makes sense to have this now fleshed out as a tool that can be used as appropriate. So I'm, I'm glad to have those in place. Ms. Burke. One quick follow up to that for the town manager. Were there to be such a report in the future that said we'd had to assess such costs, hopefully they'll just realize, no, I don't want to pay that. Um, it would be worth knowing, just as it would for the other fines that we end up levying, if there is some sense from the police chief, as we occasionally hear anecdotally from members of the public, as to whether or not the people who are assessed these fines actually end up having to pay them once sure. they go and complain about it at court. Because we certainly had that conversation way back in the right. day when we talked about how do we make it high enough that it'll be a deterrent, right. but the judge won't just say, oh, no, no, that's too high. You don't have to pay that. And so that we, we still feel confident that we're in the right sure. rough area. OK, other questions or comments about that? That's great. All right, next. Uh, staff recognitions. Uh, first, I want to recognize our public safety staff again. Uh, uh, quick summary of this past weekend. You know, with the uh, uh, 
concrete assistance from UMass. Uh, this is our second weekend of the in increased level of public safety support we've had from the university. And I again want to thank them for making that commitment to us. Uh, we had two additional ambulances on, paid by detail, uh, funded by the university. That had put us in a position where we had a maximum of six ambulances available Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. Uh, fortunately, uh, we never had to have all six in use at the same time. Uh, we did have five on the road uh, uh, at some moments. Um, so uh, uh, on Saturday and four on Friday. But uh, uh, we were covered, basically, which is the yes. whole point of this whole effort for the multiple calls if, if and when. And we'll have a similar arrangement in place for the coming weekend. On the police side, uh, we had the help of UMass on some of the joint patrols, both the horse patrol and then uh, UMass officers paired up with Amherst officers. Uh, we did have a more visible presence, both town and university police in North Amherst, for example. And that was helpful, particularly during the daytime on Saturday. Uh, we had uh, the beginnings of a large uh, outdoor party uh, midday between two and 400 people and uh, police uh, uh, had an intervention there and that broke up uh, peacefully uh, on Saturday. Uh, so felt good about the weekend. There were 45 summonses or arrests, uh, which is not an unusually high number uh, for this time of year and we thought there was there was an effective deployment, so we went looking forward to the continuation of that. Um, uh, let's see. Let's, um, in terms of recent and upcoming activity, um, I also wanted to recognize uh, two UMass student groups for their fine work. Uh, I had the pleasure of speaking briefly uh, at the uh, Kendrick Park on Sunday morning, the Autism Speaks You, which is a student group uh, from UMass, uh, put together a fundraiser to raise money on uh, autism and uh, increase awareness. Um, they had several hundred students had been organized and with some community members gathering uh, pledges uh, for a 5K run uh, Sunday morning. And uh, was able to speak to the group and really say how proud I was as a fellow, as a UMass alum. To See, this is really what the, the best of what I think UMass is all about when you see the students uh, trying to be the change on some of this stuff and take the lead. I know they, they the group had uh, secured pledges of something like $27,000, and it was really a great event. And. Uh, uh, UMass football team and the Greek community was heavily represented and Coach Molnar was there and one of the assistants. It was, just, it was great to see. Um, in the second group, uh, the Interfraternity Council, uh, a group of fraternities on campus uh, organized uh, really as a follow-up to some discussions we had with them a few months back about concrete things they might do to uh, help uh, in their community service and improve relationships with some of the neighborhoods. Uh, they organized uh, neighborhood cleanup and they intend to do this uh, every Sunday morning uh, between now and the end of the semester. Uh, they were organized by, really by chapter house into groups of up to 20 members with trash bags and they divvied up some of the neighborhoods adjacent to campus, uh, Fearing, Phillips, uh, Lincoln Avenue and some of these streets and basically did a litter patrol and uh, they were out in force on Sunday morning and it makes a difference. So I just wanted to say nice work. I'll just Tad add, appreciates it. I'll add a little bit to that. Um, and so it's in the Interfraternity Council as well as the Pan-Hellenic well, Council right, the Pan of Sororities. So um, it, they were both very well represented. It was incredibly well organized. Um, there were about, uh, there were between 120 and 130 Greeks uh, 
fraternity and sorority members out doing this. They got there about 11 o'clock. They were done by 12.30. They collected more than uh, 30 bags or about 30 bags of trash, which was a lot more than they were expecting. Um, they brought all their own supplies. They took care of everything by themselves. Um, they had really good uh, interactions with neighbors as well as uh, the Amherst police came by and talked to them and uh, uh, Dina students was out there with uh, awesome. talking to them um, and so they were just thrilled about it they were thrilled about what they did they were thrilled about the reaction the the, um, the appreciation that they got even ahead of time but certainly during and after great pictures in the Gazette today which were really nice um, and it's just it's a it, it's a tremendous visual and practical actual um, uh, it, really good deed being done by uh, university students, and uh, I, I just think it was tremendous. So I, I join Mr. Musanti in thanking them very much for doing that. Great. And lastly, I would just mention one follow-up issue. I do plan to come back uh, and give you a, a thorough report uh, at one of your upcoming April meetings related to affordable housing issues at Rolling Green and the Echo Hill uh, apartments as a follow-up of some of the good work that's been done at the staff level and with the Housing and Sheltering Committee uh, with tenants, et cetera. So you can expect to uh, get a, a pretty good report uh, later this month. Um, and I'll just expand on your recent and upcoming a little sure. bit. Um, Mr. Musanti and I have been in a number of meetings with <laughs> university uh, <laughs> and representatives over the last couple of weeks. Um, including uh, we had a, a big meeting on the 22nd of March, which was where the ambulance and police information was all hammered out. And uh, it, that was a really, a very productive, very strong meeting with uh, UMass officials and Mr. Musanti and I, uh, and the fire chief and police chief. Um, we also met with the newly elected uh, SGA president and vice president last week. This, the, um, the new officers are elected in the spring before uh, spring break and then they take office uh, at near the end of April. So we're already kind of establishing those relationships and this is something that uh, happens every year, you know, reaching out to them, getting to know them um, and getting making sure all those contacts are made and um, they're going to also be meeting with the chief of police as well as folks from the chamber and the bid and just kind of trying to make sure that they get connected to everybody they need to be connected to. Um, we also went to an interfraternity council meeting uh, along with health director Julie Fetterman uh, about a week ago at the Lord Jeff. This is uh, the, the interfraternity council meets every Thursday. They had this particular meeting downtown um, in part to accommodate us, try and make it convenient for us to attend. Uh, and, and it was great. I mean, they were very well organized. They do all kinds of philanthropic work. You, you wouldn't believe the, the stuff that each of them was reporting on doing. They had a big presence at the Autism Speaks uh, thing that Mr. Nusanti mentioned. They also were part of the St. Baldrick's um, event that happened this weekend. They also were out there with uh, uh, Mr. Zomek and uh, or I don't, actually, I don't know if Dave was out there himself or just his crew, crews from the, the um, land management folks on Mount Pollux doing cleanup and, and tree planting and everything. So those were the Greeks also um, on Saturday. So uh, all kinds of really, really good stuff going on with students right now who really just want to want to be a part, want to show that um, that uh, that the students are actually an incredibly positive uh, presence in town. And it's really it's really meaningful that they're looking to counter the negative parts of the, the very few who cause problems. So uh, it's been very, very good. Where many of us are invited to dinner, uh, I think all of us are invited, many of us are attending a dinner at, <laughs> uh, at Pi Kappa Phi this week uh, on Thursday. So that will be very interesting. Um, we also uh, went to the spring strategy meeting um, last week. This was held at UMPD. This is an, uh, this is the second year this has happened. Apparently, it used to happen like every year, but it hasn't been happening recently. But it was restarted last year, where Dean of Students Office officials from the town and landlords get together and. Um, and, and other officials from the university get together and share intelligence on uh, what uh, patrol plans are for the spring, what the plans are with the buses, what, what kind of uh, information anybody's hearing about particular parties that are planned, things like that. It was a, uh, that was a good, 
good bunch of information shared there. Um, and there's information about all of this in the packets. I included the um, the press release that the university put out after that strategic planning meeting. Um, and uh, there's also, so folks at home know, um, the discipline report, the most recent discipline report for um, the university for the semester is in our packets as, oh, more stuff? I'm not sure, check the web packet. There's more information in there than it's we in can there. talk about tonight because it's really late. Um, so it just, just emphasizing that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with the university <laughs> at like every level all the time with all kinds of people. That is all. Okay, anybody else have any questions or comments for Mr. Musanti about anything? Ms. Spur. You wanted to tell us about oh, this. Oh, yes. Uh, and I was going to ask so you to pretty. give a briefing on the, uh, all the recommendations from that. But uh, <laughs> uh, I also participated uh, at a forum uh, last week down at Springfield Technical Community College uh, sponsored by Mass Inc. Uh, a transportation forum and uh, wore my PVTA board chair hat that day talking about uh, transportation uh, finance and uh, focus mostly on uh, regional transit and the uh, their new report, Mass Inc's new report that directly links uh, quality, uh, frequent, uh, consistent public transit service as a fundamental component to healthy, growing economic vitality, particularly in our gateway cities, our, our larger urban centers. And I not unabashedly lumped Amherst into that category as a major economic hub of the state with the flagship campus here and the uh, other two colleges. Um, so just making the case for investment. And uh, the good news is that both the governor's plan and uh, portions of the legislature's plan are are very responsive to the need to shore up and give adequate funding to regional transit like the PVTA. And there's regional equity uh, objective, which many of us have, is, is we think uh, being addressed in the funding formulas uh, for the PVTA. Thank you. Questions or comments about that? I'll note that PVTA director uh, Mary McGinnis uh, complimented Mr. Musanti's <laughs> performance at that very highly and uh, as every time I see her she talks about how how fortunate that group is to have uh, have our town's representative be Mr. Musanti who's serving as its chair so uh, we we are well represented there thanks to him at PBTA uh, okay let's see just quickly member reports we've got uh, BCG summary points are in your packet I don't think I need to go over them because they're pretty self-explanatory um, it, it's it's kind of a, a summary of the budget situation that we've already <coughs> talked about um, and everyone's budgets are well approved and in good shape for a town meeting um, JCPC do you folks have you want to talk or you want me to Basically, we, I think did we reported the last time. We're basically done, and we have a, a, a worked out budget and with make contingency plans to adapt if there is a $60,000 shortfall. So. Thank you. Uh, liaison and representative reports this time. Okay, on March 20th, there was a personnel board meeting in the morning. Um, they discussed. Uh, the need for a comparative study of non-union compensation, which um, is very much needed. Deb Bradway noted that our system of many steps within a rank is a very old fashioned system. And so that we should modernize our system. The second part of the meeting, that was from 8.30 to 9, from 9 to 10 was the annual meeting with non-union employees. Um, that Mr. Musanti was at, as was I. Um, the 2% COLA was announced, as I recall. Um, the fact that there would be healthcare premium holiday, I think was also mentioned. The major complaint is from DPW employees who feel they're falling behind because of the year that they took a 0% um, raise. Um, and uh, there was later, that day, as a matter of fact, the uh, Kanagasaki Sister City event, uh, welcoming the middle school 
Japanese children, their uh, tour leader and um, chaperones, uh, which is always a lot of fun. And I went out, to, so both John and I spoke at that meeting. And then uh, I went out for dinner with the chaperones and the um, tour guide, and that was also a lot of fun. And we have one member of the Kanagasaki Sister City Committee who can actually speak a little bit of Japanese, so that was a nice interaction to see. Um, what else? Let's see. On March 28th, um, CPAC met to basically approve um, the spending that had been decided the previous week, but there was one new addition, and that is $15,000 to um, help the people um, who are being uh, asked to leave because, or, or pay much higher rents at the Echo Village Eagle Crest property. Um, and they have not had to put down, for example, um, rent deposits at the beginning. So they have no money coming back to help them move on to the next location. And so this is really a very small amount, but it was felt that it would kind of leverage more funds to help with this process with them. Um, and all the other spending has been, for CPAC, has been, um, for the CPA, has been very nicely put online by Mary Streeter with illustrations. You really ought to go and take a look at it. And anybody who's interested in um, how CPAC um, took care of their funding request this year, it's very well spent out there. And we, uh, March 27th was the audit committee, um, and basically they looked to see if the town is in compliance with appropriate auditing practices, and basically we really are. There's a management letter which deals with a few very small number of complaints, and very often they're just things didn't get communicated to town staff so they couldn't react in an appropriate way, or they made a, a, a small error, which was then remediated. So um, I was going to talk about why people think there's more money um, than there really is, which basically has people, I have been approached to say that we have a million or two million dollars more than we spend, and why don't we spend it? And that's really just an accounting thing. It's the time with which money moves out of free cash. And it has to do with billing. And if you want a more coherent explanation of that, I will be delighted to give it to you. But not until I clarify something that I received in an email, which seems to me to be missing a figure. So that'll have to be next time. OK. And so that's, um, that's part of the, the year-end summary that we get from Mr. Pooler uh, right. every year that talks about the, the overages and the underages from each department and how, they, right. how it all works out. So right. it's, And I'm uh, missing one total figure. So that's like less than 1% or it's like 1.1% oh, or something of our budget. Oh, it's a very small amount so. that we really have less. It's 150000 but um, and that's you know when you consider the overall budget, it's a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Right, especially when you consider that the budget is based on projections, so you don't know what the money is sure. for sure that you're going to need to spend and what's going to come in. So to come in within basically one. But there's of something about the accounting practice that leads one to believe there's more money left than there really is, and that's what I'd like to be able to present to you in a more coherent way. Okay, good. But I need another figure to do it. All right. Questions or comments from Ms. Stein? Other liaison reports? Go ahead. Uh, just Mr. briefly, uh, Historical Commission has not met since we last met, but they are meeting tomorrow night, at which time they will take up the question of Article 36 for the proposed rezoning of those two lots at the intersection of Gray Street and Main Street. Uh, the Dickinson Historic District Committee met last Monday. A week ago, and they formally decided not to exercise their 
right or first option to undertake the study for North Amherst District. So they would then request that the select board appoint a separate study committee for that purpose. And residents had expressed some interest in an earlier request for a committee to study the possibility of a district uh, in this, as you know, in the sunset area that's been the object of uh, rental conversions and student disturbances and so forth. And what had happened before that is that the commission had expressed general support for the idea of a, a study there, but there hasn't been a formal request made to select board, as you know. I think it's partly a question of what, what town staff can do also. I think you alluded to that with the question of the, the UMass town gown cooperation. Uh, if we keep producing committees that take staff time and go on for a year or a year and a half uh, with 30 meetings, that's something to be considered also. So I think, bef and I think in general, the town staff sense was that it was hard to have multiple things going uh, concurrently. We might want to think about the best way to move things forward and yet make careful use of staff time. So that's something that may be taken up in separate meetings. That's the basic, uh, the, uh, there was a question last time about the North Amherst, so that's the answer to the question now. So are you saying that um, th they are continuing to chew on that question of staff and, and how to best do this, or it, it, they have not yet sent any request to us or recommendation, correct? Right, they have not yet. Whether they would, I don't know, but my, I think the sense of staff that I got from talking to staff is that there's a little bit of hesitancy about going forward with too much too soon mm -hmm. and not being able to devote appropriate attention to it. Okay. Ms. Brewer. I'm happy to hear that um, they, they followed our lead on the Dickinson followed our lead mm -hmm. on wanting North Hammer to be its own separate study committee of course that does mean that Nate Malloy has to go ahead and solicit from the various uh, professional organizations as well as our ongoing attempts to recruit people through the CAF process so that's great but it's a step in the direction that we said we were going to go into right. and certainly if you know if anyone were to ask me personally I would say that yeah please let's put sunset and everything else on hold until we at least get through this because Dickinson has taken this long to really get off the ground in terms of their ability to do that just simply because of the logistics of getting people together and resources so um, although it's very fascinating to study all these things I'm just not clear when we would do all these things and it's not like Nate's gonna just be able to snap his fingers and get the architects and the realtors and everybody else to just give us answers right away either so there's a lot of follow-up involved in these things thank you Other questions or comments for Mr. Wald Anything else for us? Okay, Ms. Burr. Um, this week, the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee is meeting to look at what programs have been funded in the past, et cetera. So that, that's a meeting that's being held the same night that we're going to dinner. So I said I'd be late. Um, so that's Thursday the 11th for anybody who's interested in looking at the criteria, again, that they look at and how they follow up on what people said they were going to program and what they actually programmed. Um, so that's worth checking out and other items specifically I guess I will just mention regional school district planning we are looking at developing an agreement associated with pre-k to six for three towns not including Shutesbury Shutesbury is still at the table helping us develop this in hopes that in a year or two they would be able to join such an item however they will not be bringing it to a vote in the fall in the same way that the town of Amherst would be and will be and the uh, towns of Leverett and Pelham will be we have a ton of work to do between now and June and if you see our wonderful finance committee chair Andy Steinberg looking stressed out please tell him what good work he's doing on the <laughs> regional city. because you know town meeting time finance committee regional city, really bad timing <laughs> so, unfortunately um, his leadership has been incredibly invaluable we can't possibly let him not do it and uh, it's it's definitely been a strain so we are having lots of subcommittee I for example am associated with both timeline communications and with governance so and if there's anybody out there that strangely enough hasn't heard of this already and is hearing of it for the first time at select board please we have a web page for both the local group and for the regional group and there's lots of information out there and we'll be having lots more meetings so that we can present something to the voters in Amherst at an actual election in November completely off cycle of everything else thank you uh, as you mentioned that I'll just note that um, uh, a uh, call from the town manager did go out to residents today with a reminder about the election tomorrow as well as the 
um, two off-cycle elections that are coming out for the uh, Senate primary and then the Senate election. It also talked about um, deadlines for registering to vote for those elections, et cetera. Um, so that was both a, a call, an email to anyone who subscribes to that and is on the town website now. So uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry I forgot to recognize that. So thank you very much for that. I had actually a number of different people approach me about it, and so they were extremely grateful that you did that. And because uh, it is a lot for people to keep track of, particularly the different voter registration deadlines, and of course that means a lot of work for our town clerk as well. So thank you for that. She also, was happy for me to record it. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. And I also should just mention briefly that I did go to the veterans session at Stan's Municipal Conference, met Coleman Nee, terrific guy, really interesting programs. Um, the one thing I do want to get copied and send along to us is Kulik is presenting a couple of bills and I, I just have to check with Ellen and Stan and see if they think, oh yeah, these are great. And then we get our usual free pass on lobbying people like, yeah, they already agree with us so we don't have to worry about it um, to make sure that there's nothing else to it. But the idea being that the state would take on, instead of reimbursing us for a portion of the veterans benefits that we're required by the Commonwealth to provide on a community by community basis and then getting reimbursed eventually that the state would take on the full amount but not change how the actual veteran service officer works because we have such a great veteran service officer Steve Connor who everyone at the at the meeting loved and kept bringing up oh you have to be part of this with this guy he's great um, and so that it was it was a positive to hear again about how terrific our system was and also just the idea because for example some very very small communities are having trouble with when you know when when you have such a small budget if they have four veterans move in and get services and they don't get reimbursed for a year 18 months they're actually looking at an override vote on their town operating budget to cover things like this so it's kind of insane when you think about it because why would it matter what town you're in so um, he's got some legislation pending to try and smooth that out but again where's the money going to come from to do it in that fashion just like forward funding of regional mm -hmm. transit so okay let's see uh, my liaison reports i haven't been to housing authority since i don't know when i missed the council on aging meeting the other day conservation commission they're doing excellent work the only thing they need me for is like open meeting um uh law uh, right um what's the word i'm looking for like guidance you know conflict of interest stuff or whatever but th th those meetings are fascinating um budget coordinating group we already talked about campus and community coalition oh i'll remind us all that uh walk this way which i have not heard a report on except just generally that it went well on friday night is this is the campaign to try and encourage students to avoid kind of the neighborhoods just north of or mm. just south of the university uh in their travels um going to and from wherever they're going. Uh, in the evenings, that was from 10.30 to 2.30, I, I understand it went very well Friday. I did not do that one because we had to be up so early Saturday morning for Stan's conference, but I am doing it the, the next two Saturdays, so we volunteers needed welcome. Anybody who wants to do the 10.30 <coughs> to 2.30 overnight shift, <laughs> yes. That's what I thought, you but the youngest. <laughs> if, uh, if you uh, if you change your mind, you know, let me know. <laughs> if anybody from the community would like to do it, let me know. Um, so yeah, that's coming up the next two weekends. Um, safe and healthy. Safe and healthy is probably going to meet again just to talk about the final results of the um, the revisions to the rental bylaw. Um, it, it, it's all essentially the same. It's like 98 percent, 99 percent the same as what the recommendation was, but. Um, town council and uh, even the attorney general town council gave it a good review attorney general <coughs> gave it a, a quick review and so some changes needed to be made to to deal with that um select board is going to deal with that article taking position on that on the 22nd um so uh so we can talk all about those details then i think that is all oh no other things no those are my liaison reports but chair's report um covers almost everything except I just want to note two things one for the public uh, that 
in this room in three weeks on April 29th, Monday at five o'clock. We're going to have a coffee hour reception to honor Harrison Gregg for his long service as moderator. All are welcome. That will be again at five o'clock preceding that night's select board meeting. That is our last select board meeting before town meeting. So that seemed like a good time to recognize our change in moderator. Um, there will be a uh, official gavel passing at that moment and uh, so that that should be nice and um, please spread the word that the community is is very invited to attend that and express their all of our great appreciation and respect for mr greg and his long service in that role um, additionally i'll just remind select board that we have been invited to a finance committee meeting on april 25th we got an email about this about a week ago this is for an update on the opeb situation we had a new actuarial study and report we have the report but this is the opportunity to ask questions about it um, it seemed to make more sense to invite all the boards and committees to a finance committee meeting rather than all of us try and create a new meeting uh, at this time of year um, so that is Thursday the 25th it is in this room at 7 o'clock if you can't make it um, it is televised so if you have questions uh, further questions then by all means you can uh, watch the meeting if you have questions about the report which we have been provided already uh, mr. Pooler's is finance director Sandy Pooler is asking that questions be submitted ahead of time just to increase the likelihood of the OPEB actuarial person being able to respond to them so uh, that is all um, we meet next Tuesday because Monday is a holiday we're meeting Tuesday in this room um, for that particular meeting of that particular week we have lately met on Wednesday at the police station but instead we're meeting Tuesday and in this room so I'll see you all or as many as can be here on Tuesday uh, at 630 the 16th and we have a couple of other untimed items but mm -hmm. those are all the things um, needed to be reported on does anybody have anything that needed to be reported on that we haven't mentioned okay good because it's really late so let's finish up our untimed items okay you ready yes all right <laughs> i move that the select board approve the reservation of the first three this is um the extravaganza uh, the first three metered parking spaces on the east side of South Pleasant Street going south from the intersection of Spring Street and six metered parking spaces originating at the fifth meter on the west side of Boltwood Avenue moving south towards College Street from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. and the south side of the Spring Street parking lot from 1.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturday, April 20th for the UMass Amherst Cannabis Reform Coalition's Extravaganza Festival. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. All right. The Garden Club plant sale. I move that the select board approve the reservation of 18 meter parking spaces on the south side of the Spring Street parking lot for the Garden Club. Garden Club of Amherst's annual plant sales set up on Friday, May 17, 2013, beginning at 6.30 a.m. through no later than 6 p.m. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say Wait. aye. Oh. Stop. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I just want to know, this is their entire thing. Why does it say plant sales set up? That almost sounds like a, a pre- event it is I'll for the pre-event okay it's so it's not for it's not for the sale itself it's for the okay that's coming another time i i don't believe they ask for they don't parking for the event okay. they only for ask all for the, all the people to bring their plans. all right yeah. well anyway then i'm so, done so it's good so <laughs> we can vote all right uh all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. all that's right unanimous. new taxi driver chauffeur licenses I move that the select board approve a new taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Terrence Fahey of Florence Mass, May, MA, rather, on behalf of Gotta Go Taxi Company. For discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a new taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Timothy Kane of Northampton, MA, on behalf of Celebrity Cab Company. Second. 
for the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, so we are also going to sign Wait the warrant. Minute. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, the minutes I never got. Uh, there, that, there are no minutes for your review tonight. That's a shouldn't be on the motion sheet. Okay. Well, I decided that they should be, and then that they shouldn't be, and then I saw these dates on there, and I thought. I'm We're not lost. doing any minutes. <laughs> not doing they're minutes. They're not. Okay. Not gonna <laughs> um, so we are signing the warrant. That doesn't require a vote, but I do want it noted that we are doing that at this meeting. We have to sign the warrant as well as the liquor license, a couple of other things. So don't leave until you've signed things. And uh, that is all. We already said that we're meeting uh, Tuesday. Uh oh, if Mr. Hayden isn't here, how are we ever going to adjourn? <laughs> uh, <laughs> without Mr. objection. Wall, side of the room has to adjourn. <laughs> without objection, this meeting adjourns at 10.03. Thank you very much. Thank you.